Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Grow in Wisdom. Grow in Wisdom. Sean Isaacs here. I am, first of all, I want to begin with an apology. I was planned and scheduled to go live at uh, 930. And then I realized that um, I have a house full of people. And uh, in this house full of people is a lot of noise right now. Well, with all the noise, I realized I couldn't go live downstairs. And so at the last minute, I had to try to pull pull some things to pull, pull, pull a location together so I can jump on and uh, kind of share my thoughts and my heart. So first of all, I want to begin with an apology for those of you that were prepared to join me at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it took me a little bit longer than I intended to to get to get here and to go live. So I hope you guys will still get this link and you're, you're still able to jump on. Uh, but those of you that are, that are new to the channel or new to anything that I do, welcome to Grow in Wisdom. And what is Grow in Wisdom? Grow in Wisdom. It's my passion to help God's people, first and foremost, to grow in, to grow in wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all of your getting, get understanding. And so uh, wisdom is one of those things that can be used, useful for anything and everything in life. And uh, if you've ever said at any point in your life, I wish I knew this, then... You know, I wish I knew this 10 years ago. I wish, you know, I wish I knew this 20 years ago. I, I wish I knew this before I got married. I wish I knew this before I started college. If, you have, if you've ever said that, that gap between where you were and where you are now, in one sense, can be defined as wisdom, though it's loosely defined, because biblical wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, right? And if you don't have the fear of God, then you lack God's wisdom, so... I want to say uh, welcome to all of you that are jumping on tonight. I have what I think is a topic that I think can be helpful and encouraging. I'm not sitting in the room that I normally sit in. Uh, again, if you're just joining, I, I have quite a bit of people in my house tonight. And because of that, it's uh, a lot of extra noise. And so that's the reason for the delay tonight in going live. So um, because of the extra com company and the extra noise, I needed to get somewhere quiet. And uh, so I don't even have a background or anything, but hey, maybe uh, with it being clear and clean, you can better see what's going on. So those of you that are joining on Facebook or YouTube, uh, I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and share this link. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the wisdom of, of Venus, you know, Venus Williams versus uh, Rihanna. Venus Williams versus Rihanna. What's the wisdom there? And if you don't know what this uh, topic is about, a few weeks ago, uh, Venus Williams um, did an interview and shared how she was a virgin, a virgin at 41 years old. And uh, around the same time, Rihanna had come out with some pictures. Maybe she didn't, but others came out with pictures and other things showing that Rihanna was pregnant and uh, out of wedlock, obviously. Maybe it's not obvious to you. And, um, and the thing that stood out to me is um, the amount of people that were shaming uh, Venus Williams for being a virgin at 41, while at the same time, uh, others celebrating Rihanna, who at this point appears to be having a, ba a baby out of wedlock. Now, it looks like from the little that I looked at that she, from what I heard today and from what I've looked at, that she is planning to get married after uh, she has the baby. And if that's true, I say, you know, that's great. That's great. I hope that the marriage lasts. Uh, marriage is extremely difficult. It's hard to build. It is especially difficult if you're famous, if you're wealthy, if you're independent, if you've waited a long time, uh, like decades to do it, and you're used to making your own money, doing your own thing. Uh, it's extra difficult to, to build a good marriage, in my opinion. This is just my opinion. So again, welcome to Grow in Wisdom. I have a lot to share tonight, and uh, I, I'm not going to try to be too late tonight because I'm starting a half hour 
later than I intended to. But if you are on Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and just leave a one in the chat. I'd like to say hello to you. Tell me where you're where you are, where you're listening in from. Uh, that that's always helpful. You know, where are you listening in from? Uh, that would be uh, something that would uh, kind of just uh, I like to greet people and find out where they're from. That's important. So John Baptist, what's up, John? Good to hear. Good to see you here, brother. Uh, if you were if you were prepared to get here earlier, uh, please forgive me, man. I, I ran into some challenges and I could say the enemy, the enemy does not want this topic and he probably does not But uh, who knows? Right. I'm not going to get into any of that. God is still sovereign. God is still in control. And uh, I'm going to assume the people that need to see and hear this information are the people that will. And uh, it just remind I'm just reminded that I'm supposed to send this link to someone else. Uh, so you're from from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, brother. All right, that's great. It's good to see you here tonight. Raquel is from JA. What's JA? Is that Jamaica? I don't know what JA is. Um, I don't know what JA is. Yeah, I was wondering where you were. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, brother. Uh, I'm here. Um, I, I'm sorry again. I'm late, but uh, but I have a lot to share, and I think it will be helpful. We're going to talk a little bit about dating. We're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about abstinence. We're going to talk about celibacy, purity. Do these things matter? Does it matter if you're a virgin before you get married? Um, I'm going to tell you up front, you know, I was married for 27 years. Many of you know that I buried my wife in December. Uh, I'm sad to say that I was not a virgin when I got married. I was very promiscuous uh, before getting married. And when I came to Christ, uh, I am happy to say that I was not sexual, sexually uh, involved with any woman uh, for years before I got married, once I became a Christian. And I'm happier to say that my wife, my wife uh, was a virgin when we got married. And uh, uh, I wish I can go back uh, before I got married and have no promiscuity and have no sexual relations. Because I got to tell you, it put demands on my relationship that weren't necessary. It created struggles in my marriage that were not necessary. That if I could go back to my teenage years and, and punch my friend in the face who introduced me to pornography, I would do that, right? Um, again, I don't blame him for that. But but that created a lot of challenges later on in my uh, marriage in just what I expected. And uh, so I'm going to share some things tonight that I think can be helpful to those of you. You know, I spoke to a friend today who uh, was talking to another friend, female friend, who's 44 years old and a virgin, 44 years old and a virgin. And so uh, if you think this is abnormal, uh, maybe there are people who, who are living this life of celibacy or of ch chastity. Maybe there, there's a, sense, a level of commitment to purity and they're not vocal about it because of all the, the shame in our culture. Not sure. Right. Um, April Chapman, Seiko Woods. Oh, you're tagging some folks. All right, John. Thanks, brother. Thank you. So I'm going to jump into this topic. We're going to get into the word of God. I'm going to share some wisdom about why I believe Venice Williams or Venus Williams. I keep messing up her name. Forgive me, Lord. Venus Williams. <laughs> why I believe that her uh, choice is a good one. Now, there's a guy on YouTube that's really popular right now. His name is Kevin Samuels. And Kevin Samuels, the last I recall, has been teaching men, men that by the third date, by the third date, you need to, uh, teaching women, by the third date, you need to give it up. You need to be intimate with the guy and saying to guys from what I've heard, right, that by the third date, uh, if she does not allow you to be sexual with her, you need to move on, right? And uh, is this good advice? Does this fit with the scriptures? Is this smart scientifically, psychologically? We're going to find out tonight. We're going to get into some things that I hope can be helpful uh, to you guys. If you're just jumping on, uh, Brother Xerxes, uh, good to see you, brother. I was tremendously blessed by uh, that that uh, that live you did on uh, Brother Marcus, brother, <laughs> on Marcus Rogers. Guys, I am so off right now. I hate to be late. I hate to be off. And so pray for me, man, because I am in my own head for a little bit. So I want to just calm myself down a bit. But brother, thank you for Thank you for dropping that uh, that that uh, that that great nugget of wisdom uh, at, with Walter Martin, and uh, I appreciate Sister April Chapman. I don't know if you know, but she reposted that video on YouTube, and uh, uh, I hope that many will get a chance to see that. 
And I hope you'll be inspired, brother, if you're not on YouTube, to, to start taking what you're doing on um, what you're doing on uh, Facebook, taking it to YouTube. So uh, what sparked, let me talk a little bit about what uh, some of the things I'm going to share tonight is why this broadcast? Why am I, why am I dealing with this topic, right? Why am I talking about Venus Williams and Rihanna? I don't listen to secular music personally, so why would I even care about what Rihanna is doing? Well, she's extremely popular and uh, I think extremely uh, and very talented. Um, I think that Rihanna, in my opinion, is one of the most talented artists uh, uh, today. I believe personally, I think she's better than Beyonce to me. And I'm a musician. I'm a singer. Just her versatility, right? That's just me, right? Uh, just as they say, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. I think uh, music, right? And your what we our taste is in the eyes of the beholder. But I'm going to talk a little bit about why the broadcast, why I decided to get into this topic. I'm going to share with you how you and I should think about Rihanna, right? As Christians, how should we approach this topic? Uh, there are a lot of YouTubers, Christian YouTubers and broadcasters that talk about the unbeliever and the unlearned in manners or in ways that I don't think represent well the character of Jesus. I believe that Jesus held a higher standard for those who knew better, those who knew the truth, especially for those who were hypocritical, those who knew what the scripture said and didn't live it would judge with severe judgment. As scripture says, he that knows his master's will and does it not will receive a stricter judgment. So how should the church approach Rihanna? How should the church approach Venus Williams, who is a Jehovah's Witness, which goes contrary to that which we believe? We're told in the book of 1 John that if someone comes to your door and they don't have the gospel, the truth of the gospel, it doesn't mean if an unbeliever comes to your door, but if someone is spreading a message that is opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ and they don't accept Christ as God in the flesh, God says, don't even let them in your house. The way you approach an unlearned and unbeliever is different from the way you approach a religious person that is claiming to preach or proclaim a message that is antithesis or the antithesis or the opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is consistent if you look at the book of Galatians. You know, 1 Corinthians, that church is living in sin, but the apostle Paul begins that letter by describing that church, in that church, there are saints that have been set apart to Christ. But when God deals with the church of Galatia, there is no pleasantries. There is no introduction. There is nothing nice being said. He goes right for the issue because you're dealing with the potential of, of damning souls, right? So how should we think about Venus, uh, Venus Williams, right, as, as a Jehovah's Witness? And then we're going to talk a little bit about what people are saying about the idea of sexual purity and sex before marriage. I'm telling you right now that I, as a person who was very sexual before I said I do, said to my wife on many occasions, I wish I never uh, 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 was exposed to pornography, number one, and that I was not sexually intimate before I said I do. It created demands on our marriage. It created unnecessary uh, temptations. And on and on I can go. I was sharing with a friend today that, you know, if I if my house was filled with cocaine, I could walk in and out of my house every day for the next 10,000 years, and I would never be tempted to take cocaine. Why? Because I've never tasted it. I've never had an appetite for it. I've never been, expo been exposed to it or experienced it. I can't say the same about women. Right, because of what I've been exposed to. And I've walked with the Lord now for more than 30 years. And Paul says in Romans chapter 6 that sin remains in our bodies. And what does that mean? Once your body has had a taste for something that is immoral, that is sinful, that is wrong, that is off limits, it is harder to resist. It's harder to say no. And so there's a lot of benefit, I think, in Understanding what God says in the word about these matters and how you should approach it. And then uh, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, about some other practical things that you can do if you are seeking to be abstinent and um, and so on and so on. So, so, wow, let's see. I see a lot of posts in here, some stuff that um, 
Yeah, brother says, I, I miss those days when brothers dwelt together at Newark. Yeah, brother, I, I enjoyed the fellowship. I'm so happy to see that you are still consistent. Your passion and love for Christ is still the same. And so um, praise God for, for that. So let's see. I'm not sure who this is or what this online strips, stripes without clothing. I'm not sure uh, online strips without clothing. I'm not sure who that is. Um, I got to keep my eye on this chat area. Anyway, so guys, I'm going to jump into this topic. I hope that, that something here can be that can be helpful. And uh, actually, I'm going to I'm going to get rid of this person. I'm not sure who they are, and I don't like what I'm seeing them posting. So, good evening to you, Laura. Good, good evening. It's good to see you. Those of you that are um, that are that are coming in through uh, Facebook or YouTube, feel free to leave your questions if you have any questions. And if any of you want to come live uh, uh, on this matter, you know, just let me know, and I'll be happy to uh, to pull you in uh, with one condition: you need to be ready to cam up. You got to turn on your video. If you're coming live, we got to be able to see them. And I'd love uh, anyone that wants to give some input or uh, has a question about the topic. I'll be more than happy to uh, more than happy to engage you. All right. Uh, iron sharpens iron. We all get to learn from each other. So, so let's get into the topic tonight. I want to talk a little bit about the wisdom of Venus 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 Williams versus uh, Venus Williams versus Rihanna. All right. Um, and so again, uh, those of you that may not be aware, uh, a few weeks ago few weeks ago, uh, Venus Williams uh, came, did a, uh, an interview and came out with uh, some information that uh, for some reason was a complete shock. And that was, and that is that at, uh, she said that at 41 years old, that she was still a virgin, that she's still a virgin at 41 years old. And um, I think this is huge um, announcement to make. Uh, I actually celebrated personally. Uh, but at the same time, around the same time, uh, Aesop Rocky, right, who's dating Rihanna, there's pictures of them online who are saying, you know, saying that, um, you know, uh, that at some point they're going to get married, but she's showing her stomach and she's pregnant, obviously. And so why did I decide to do this broadcast? Well, a friend of a friend, uh, RJ Smith, uh, actually posted uh, a post that uh, actually got me thinking about this. And here is what he said. And so I'm just going to read some of what he said with little commentary, and, uh, and then I'm going to give you my thoughts, okay? He says, this post may offend some people, but, but, make it, but, but I want you to make it make sense, he says. Venus Williams, Venus, Venus Williams recently stated that she's a virgin at age 41 and is waiting to be married before having sex. So she's waiting to be married before having sex, he says. She received so much backlash for remaining true to her values and beliefs. However, society tells us she's wrong. All right. So, again, um, what sparked this is, again, he gave the contrast of these two women. And here is Venus Williams, who is saying because of her religious convictions that she has chosen to abstain from sex that she will be celibate until she's married. Uh, the, the RJ goes on to say that as of yesterday, Rihanna announced her pregnancy by her boyfriend, not husband, and she's receiving all kind of applause and congratulations. Now he says, now I'm not sure the baby will be beautiful. However, I'm perplexed. He says, I'm sure, sorry. He says, I'm sure that the baby will be beautiful. However, I'm perplexed that we'll applaud that, but not an individual who truly is sticking to her standards. So I'm going to start out by saying, I don't have a problem that people are celebrating a baby is coming into the world. I don't have a problem with that. Babies being born out of wedlock, that is, um, that's been, um, that's been like normal for centuries, right? Um, now, the way we've looked at it throughout history is different than the way it's celebrated today. I think a baby coming into the world is an awesome thing. Uh, but I think the thing that stands out to me, and it seems like it did R.J. Smith, is that there seems to be this celebration of Rihanna, but people that are against uh, the idea that this woman wants to, uh, Venus Williams wants to hold on to her convictions. So he goes on to say, tell me why, why is it 
that we love applauding things that are not in its proper order and demean that which is. So by proper order, uh, he is referring to, I think, biblical order, right? What's the order that God has instituted? God has created sex. God has created man. God has created marriage. So he's the one that should determine how these things should be uh, used and in what context, right? So he says, has, says, help me understand. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many whom I love who choose to begin a family outside the confines of marriage, and I love and support them. But my support of someone who's choosing to wait and do it according to holy ordinance is going to weigh a little bit more for me. So the first thing I want to say is RJ, in my opinion here, is very balanced. He is seeking to say, listen, I applaud the person that has the convictions that I do, that which he describes holy ordinance, while at the same time, I have loved ones and friends that have chosen to have children out of wedlock or have sex before marriage and therefore get pregnant with children. And he is not knocking or condemning them. Uh, he seems to be more concerned about the people that lack the ability to appreciate the value of celibacy, right? So this reminds me of Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, where we find these words. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. God says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to that person, right? We live in a society that reverses a lot of things. Right, That which God says is profane, that which is an abomination to God, that which God calls unholy, our culture, our society, our, our entertainment, right, generally speaking, calls it good. right? And the reverse is true. And we're seeing a little bit of that in this, in this, uh, the, this example of these two women. So Isaiah 520 again says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Woe unto them that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. God says there's such a thing as bitter and there's such a thing as sweet. In our day, what's happening in, across much of America is we're losing sight of black and white, sight of uh, this is clearly wrong and this is clearly right. right. And so bitter and sweet, you can't call bitter bitter anymore or sweet, sweet. You can't call darkness, darkness or light, light without being objected to, without being, in some cases, canceled. Well, God says, woe to the people that do that, right? Woe unto those that do that. So so the reason for me deciding to, to tackle this issue is, again, uh, this, uh, this post that this brother put up that I don't personally know. He happened to be a friend of a friend. Uh, I saw it on a friend's uh, Facebook page. All right. So um, that's that's the reason for the broadcast. Now, how should you and I think about Rihanna, in my opinion? I think Rihanna, uh, for me, right, does not live. Her, the Bible says you will know a person by their fruit. So when I look at the life of Rihanna, I look at the entertainment of, of Rihanna. I look at the, the, the content that she's producing. I look at the things she says in her interviews. I look at the way she carries herself, the way she dresses. Everything about her says to me she is worldly says to me, she is not a believer. She is not a Christian. She is not a follower of Jesus. So because I don't see her as a follower of Christ, it doesn't matter if she may have grown up in Barbados and grew up Christian. I don't know. I know nothing about her background other than she grew up in Barbados. I don't know anything about her. I'll say this. I know nothing about her religious background. None of that really matters. What matters from my perspective, and I think a biblical perspective, is what does the Bible say about what a life should look like if someone claims to be a follower of Christ or a professing Christian? And what I'm saying from what I see, she is a non-believer. She's not only a non-believer, she's an unlearned person. By that then, that means to me, she may not fully understand or know what the Bible says, what God requires, what God promises to those who violate his laws. And so since she doesn't have that perspective, possibly, from my perspective, I think I should and the church should 
look at her differently than we should someone who knows better, who is a professing Christian, someone who is part of the family of God or the body of Christ in name and not living that through their living. They are professors of Christ, but not possessors of the life. I think you should deal with them differently. So there's nothing about what I'm going to say that should sound like judgment of Rihanna to you, right? I think we are to we ought to love her as we love ourselves. That is a command of Scripture. What does that mean? That has nothing to do with how I feel about Rihanna. It's not emotion that God is talking about when he says, I'm to love Rihanna as I love myself. That means that with Rihanna, I will be long-suffering. I will be kind. I will not be easily provoked. I also will not rejoice in iniquity. See, this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 means when it tells us that charity suffereth long. So how should the church deal with the unlearned? How should the church deal with the unbeliever? We should be as God is. We should be meek. We should be kind. We should be gentle. We should be merciful, right? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity does not boast itself or vaunt it not itself. It's not puffed up. And so the attitude of the child of God against an unbeliever who is living in sin, walking in sin, acting out sin, we should have a posture of humility in the approach to them, not anger, but grief, grief, right? But there should also be a tender heart. There should be a grieving heart and soul because we should be praying for the unbeliever. We should not be we should not be looking down on the unbeliever and the unlearned, right? Scripture says it does not. Love does not behave itself unseemly, does not seek its own, is not easily provoked, does not think evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And those things should also be added, right? While you're being kind, while you're being long-suffering, while you are not being prideful or puffed up or boastful, right, and parading yourself, right, and the way you deal with another, you're also not rejoicing in iniquity, but rejoicing in the truth, right? And there's our balance. And yet it says that love, in this case, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So the way I look at Rihanna is I think about Rihanna as an unsaved woman based on her life, her testimony. And I think you and I should have compassion on her. We should be praying for her. We should be kind to her. She's lost right? Jesus is our example. And no other Christian is our example unless they're following Christ. And you hear the apostle Paul in Titus chapter three saying these words. Verse two, he says, speak evil of no man, right? He's referring to the saints. He says, let me start with verse one, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready for every good work. He's saying, the children of God should respect those and be subject to those that are in authority. But don't speak evil of any man. Don't be brawlers. That's people who fight and could cause contention. But be gentle, showing, here's the phrase, showing all meekness unto all men. How should we think about Rihanna? We should show meekness to her. Why? For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which he have done. The text goes on to say, here's the bottom line, without me reading all the verses. God says, because God showed mercy to me when I was foolish, disobedient, a whoremonger, sleeping around, going contrary to God's word, because God was long-suffering to me, merciful to me. That's how I should be with the unlearned. That's how I should be with the unbeliever. I separate those two from those who profess to be believers, from those who live in hypocrisy. Jesus deals with that group differently than he deals with the unlearned and those who 
don't know any better. Okay. Um, so Christians should think differently, I think, about the unbeliever and the unlearned. And by that, I make no judgment, right? If she wants to have 10 babies out of wedlock, that's up to her. She's an adult. She is a grown woman. She will be held accountable by God for the life she lives, the things she chooses to do. But God is the judge, right? Romans 14 says, everyone will have to give an account, right, to Christ. And um, he's the judge of both the dead and the living. And so uh, that's what I want to begin with. Uh, so this is not a judgment upon um, Venus, 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 <laughs> Venus Williams. And uh, I, I want to say Venice for some reason. I don't know why. And I know her name, Serena and Venice. I, I know the name. I just saw their story not too long ago. But my mind is, uh, I keep I keep uh, going in another place. So let's see. I got some comments here. Let me just see what you guys are saying here in the chat. Uh, guys, feel free, feel, free to, feel free to leave your comments here. Good evening. Hey, Phil. Good, good to see you, brother. Um, slave, slave of Christ. Good to see you here tonight. Uh, yo, homie. Okay. It's good to see you guys know each other in the chat. You know, guys, people are saying hello to each other. That's pretty good. Uh, hey, what up, brother? Okay, good, good, good. So folks are just saying hello. So, so, so let's, let's get into, uh, um, I want to talk about Venus Williams for a little bit and my thoughts on Venus, right? Before I get into some stats and some other things, right? So the first thing I want to say is I, I applaud this woman, right? Um, her faith is different from mine. Right. She is a Jehovah's Witness. But in reality, I'm going to say that that I am a Jehovah's Witness. Why? Because I represent Jehovah God. Um, I'm going to say uh, uh, Venus is a. Um, you know, she is um, the fact that she is following her faith. I applaud that. And so the first thing I want to say about this woman is. She must be, she must have unbelievable discipline to go 41 years. Uh, I saw some pictures where she was dating a bunch of different celebrities. And, uh, and I find it hard that she could go out with some of these celebrities. I think Drake was one of them that, uh, that apparently at some point in her life dated her or from what the tabloid said, I find it very hard to believe that these men would go out with this woman and not put some sort of pressure on her to be intimate. And, uh, and and if what she's saying is true, and I have no reason to doubt her, I think that's unbelievable discipline. I didn't have that discipline. And I grew up in church. I was surrounded by the word of God and the things of God and did not come to Christ until I was 23. So the first thing I want to say is I believe she has unbelievable discipline and that should be applauded because that's missing through much of our culture, not just in the area of of, of pure sexual purity, but just in, in general, you can't build a successful business without discipline. You can't build a successful life without discipline. Discipline, I think, is the most important character trait that affects every other choice that you and I make. It doesn't matter what other, you can have all the learning, all the information you need to carry out a task. If you lack the discipline to execute, it doesn't matter. And so I think this woman should be applauded for her unbelievable discipline in this area. And I have to believe that if she's disciplined in the area of sexual desires, which is the hardest or one of the hardest areas to, to control, then uh, she must be a woman of great virtue in that area. I would also say that because of that discipline, she appears to me to be a woman of great commitment, great commitment. I know of a number of people who lack this discipline before they got married. And uh, guess what? Because they lack the discipline before they said, I do, uh, it was hard to stay disciplined even in the marriage. There are a lot of Christians who believe that I just need to get married and that desire for sex will be tamed. And I'm going to have it under control when I say I do. And I want to tell you that even though the Bible says it's better to marry than to burn, if you don't learn to grow in the fear of God, right? There's a whole lot of information online about how to deal with pornography. And I never see anyone talking about the thing that the Bible emphasizes, the fear of God. There are people that struggle with, with lust or pornography. And here's the truth. 
if a brother or sister that you love or respect, your pastor or someone that you look up to spiritually was present in that room where you were tempted, you would not have a problem with saying no to that temptation. How do I know? Because I can say the same thing. Well, how is it that we can say no? Like, like, how can we say no if someone else, a human being is present, right? And not say no to God who is always present. Not say no, not no to God, but no, because we're aware that God is present. The reason we don't say no, because we're not aware that God is present. We're not conscious. So the fear of God has the idea of cultivating an awareness that God is present, that God is with me. God is in that room with the lights off, right? Where all the temptations lie. And so uh, I think this woman has unbelievable um, discipline and she shows strong commitment. And uh, I think if you lack the ability to be disciplined before you say I do, it's probably going to be harder to be to say no be- after you say I do to, to other temptations unless you're able to develop and nurture the fear of God in your life, right? The fear of God. You can put all sorts of apps on your phone and apps on your computer. You can create all sorts of accountability measures. You can go to, to celebrate recovery uh, and all of these different anonymous groups that, that can be and have been helpful for some. But if those things are not helping you, I'm saying to you that what you want to develop is you want to grow in the fear of God. And so the, the things I want to say about v- Venus Williams is, number one, uh, she seems to me to have unbelievable discipline to go 41 years without intimacy with a man and to be committed to say, I'm never going to have sex until I'm married. Secondly, by the way, uh, my brother got married at 39, my twin brother, and uh, he did not have sex with a woman until he was uh, until that age. So it is possible. I have another friend I was talking to this past week who after he became a Christian, he was very promiscuous before. And he said uh, he went 13 years. He also got married at 30, late 30s, I think 38, 39. And he went 13 years before he, uh, uh, until he got married, before he was sexually intimate again. So it is possible. Uh, it is going to be harder for some people than others. But as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about why this may be a good idea even for those who don't profess to be children of God or followers of the Bible, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about that. But the third thing I want to say about Venus Williams is um, she's a woman of strong commitment, right? She's a woman of strong commitment. She seems to be a woman of unbelievable discipline, and she shows unbelievable commitment to her faith. I applaud the fact that even though her faith is flawed, even though her faith is inconsistent with the Bible that she says she believes, Even though the the Jehovah that she says she worships condemns everything about the Watchtower Society and what she says she follows, I applaud the fact that she has a faith or commitment in her life that she's able to follow that keeps her uh, pure in her living, right? What do you guys think about that? Do you think these are good things that even though Venus Williams, if you believe these are good virtues, Put a one in the chat. Even though she is not a biblical Christian, a follower of Jesus, as you and I understand the Bible to teach, uh, in many ways, in many ways, she is more. She has more character, more discipline, more faithfulness, more commitment than many pastors, ministers, uh, missionaries, Christians across our nation. And this should be a challenge to the people of God. That if this woman who is unconverted, who is an unbeliever, who is still in the kingdom of darkness based on what we know the Bible to teach, then if she could do that without the grace of God, then we should be able to do it with the grace of God. Doesn't mean it's easy, okay? Doesn't mean it's easy. And I'll be the first to tell you. I'll be the first to tell you. You know, I've had a wife for 27 years, and I can tell you unashamedly that one of the unique things about my wife is she never withhold her body from me at all. If if she was tired and I needed intimacy, I could wake her up out of sleep. It didn't matter. She understood 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that when she said I do to me, that her body did not belong to her anymore. 
I understood that when I said I do to her, even though her drive, sexual drive was not as strong as mine, that if she needed intimacy, I was going to be available. But more importantly than that, if she needed romance, right? If she needed cuddling, if she needed, I, again, I have adults here, but you guys get my point, right? And I say all that to say, I'm now back in that space with you guys, if you're single, right? And uh, I don't know. I don't know, right? All I can tell you is that uh, God says his grace is sufficient. And, um, and um, you know, we have to choose to walk in his way and follow his way and pray and ask him for grace. Um, so so it's going to be interesting for me to walk this walk. And what I'm about to share with you, I'm going to share, I'm speaking now to me as well. See, it's easy for me to say as a married man, this is what you should do, right? It's harder to say that when you are, you also have to live it as well. So I got to cool myself off as I get ready for this. So what are people saying? This idea of purity and abstinence and sexual purity. Uh, you know, the problem in our in our world is some cultures, some cultures tolerate sexual activity between consenting unmarried adults, right? Adult individuals. This is normal practice throughout our world. And uh, even in some areas, it is viewed as acceptable for unmarried adolescents, teenagers, to engage in some form of sexual intimacy and activity. This is the way the logic goes. People say things like, and how many of you have heard this? If you heard this before, put a two in the chat. You need to be sexually intimate with your partner before you say I do because you don't know what you're going to get when you say I do. You need to know that you're sexually attracted. You need to know that they can fulfill your needs before you say I do. If you've heard something like this before, put a two in the chat, right? This is the logic in our world. You've heard things like you need to live with people before you get married, right? Because you don't know what they're going to be like. And guys, I'm going to tell you both of these are flawed, right? Right, right. We've seen people in Hollywood live together for years and then they get married and two to three years later, the marriage is dissolved, right? So you guys have heard these this logic, and these are lies of the enemy. Uh, Brother Slave to Christ says, I've heard this too many times, and this is coming from women. Wow, I have tend to heard it from men. Yeah, that's, that's very unfortunate. Women, I believe you have far more to lose by being sexually intimate with the guy before marriage than the guy has to lose. You have far more to lose. Um, Laura says, as a millennial... Uh, as a millennial, test trying. Oh, test trying. That's what it's called. So you got to test it out. You got to try it before. Interesting. I've never heard that before. That's new for me. Uh, yeah, Jesus Jesus loves you says that's horrible advice. Horrible advice. Here yeah, it is horrible advice. You know, before my wife and I got married again, she was a virgin. And uh, our first week, I can admit to you, it was tough, right? It was tough because everything was new for her, and I had been overly sexualized and overly experienced. And even though I had years between when I would be, once I became saved and marriage, and and I had years where I was not intimate with the woman, I still had all these memories. I still had all these expectations, right? And I had to learn how to love her by laying down my life, which meant that sexual intimacy had little to do with me. And this is where some of you get messed up, right? Let me say it this way. Not to have little to do with me. It isn't just about me. See, marriage is not just, my marriage is not about our happiness as Christians. It's about our holiness. That doesn't mean you won't have happiness in marriage. If the wife is being subjected to her husband as God commands, and the man is loving his wife as God commands, that's going to be a, a, a happy marriage, right? It's going to be full of joy and bliss, and excitement, right? Uh, as a millennial, I've heard this so often. Laura says that. Okay, that's interesting. So you guys have heard these things. So so we're gonna we're gonna destroy these myths tonight. And I'm gonna share some stats that are that not even tied to the Bible that shows that that these are myths and um, they're lies of the devil, right? So we've looked at first of all why the broadcast. Again, uh, I saw an article that's comparing the two. Rihanna and Venus Williams, 
and how our society and culture is looking at these two uh, situations. Rihanna, baby, apparently, well, right now she's pregnant, out of wedlock. But what I see, planning to get married after the baby's born, who knows what's going to happen, right? Aesop Rocky could have could change his mind, or she can change her mind, you know, uh, before they have the baby. Anything can happen. Um, I don't think that's smart, uh, smart to do, but that's her choice. We talked a little bit about how we should think about Rihanna. She's an unbeliever. She's a lost person. So I have no judgment upon her. I am concerned uh, in cases where in, in Black America, one of our biggest challenges is children born out of wedlock, homes where uh, homes with single moms. I come from a home with a single mom. My wife came from a home with a single mom. I can go on and on about all the challenges that were brought into our marriage because of a, both of us coming from single homes. Okay. And so, uh, and again, there's lots of information out there if anyone wants to look for it. The Bible says in, in James chapter 1, verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God is to, quote, visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction. The fatherless and widow, what do they have in common? There's no male. What does God call that state in a home? An afflicted home. Something is missing in the home when there's no male. A lot is missing when there's no godly male, spiritual headship in that home. Okay, so how should we think of how should we think of Venus Williams? Uh, we should be convicted by her commitment, her discipline, her 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 ability to have a faith in what she believes is her God that allows her to be disciplined and committed in this area of sexual purity, which is so hard for so many of us if we are honest and we're willing to to walk in truth and be transparent and vulnerable. So what are people saying? In our culture, it's normal. And this is why people celebrated Rihanna, right? Uh, there's a time when if a woman had was pregnant out of wedlock, that was looked down upon. If you remember in the Bible, in the book of Luke and in the book of Matthew, that that Joseph, who had been, who had been, Mary had been betrothed to Moses. She had been given to Moses to uh, for marriage and went to Moses, to Joseph. When Joseph found out that she had been pregnant, he wrestled with whether or not he should put her away, right? Whether, and that's not divorce, but put her away. Um, that's, by the way, those terms are not synonymous. Um, put her away has to do with the legal, I mean, uh, divorce has to do with the legal action through the state where you give a bill of divorcement. Putting away was something that men in Jesus's day just did. If they weren't happy with a woman, uh, if they woke up one day and they didn't like how you did something, they could just put you away and just choose to send you away. And that was a huge problem in the first century. Um, but Joseph was prepared to do that uh, because of the shame that went with uh, marrying a woman that uh, had a baby out of wedlock uh, or who was pregnant in advance. There's a time in America where that was a huge problem. All right. And uh, so uh, I'm just comparing to show how our world has changed. So what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about these things? Well, I'll get into what the Bible says in a moment. I want to share I want to share something with you from uh, catholicmatch.com. catholicmatch.com says according to the CDC disease control, 90% of men and 86% of women have had sex before marriage. 90% of men, according to the CDC, and 86% of women have had sex before marriage. Now, uh, you, I, I take these statistics with a grain of salt. I take all statistics with a grain of salt. Why? Because it's impossible to interview every human being on the planet to put the data together. So what do they have to do? They take a population. They take a portion of the population. Let's call it 2,000 people. And they interview the 2,000 people. And based on those numbers, 90% of the men said they had sex before marriage. 86% of the women said they had sex before marriage. And so they then take that data and they scale it and apply it to the population that they are, that they are um, looking to, um, the population that they want you and I to be thinking about as they give us this, this data. And why I take this with a grain of salt, even though I believe the numbers are really high, I take this with a grain of salt because 
If you believe that the majority of people are intimate, are having sex before marriage, it's going to be harder for you to say no. So you got to be careful with data because sometimes the enemy can be controlling the narrative to weaken your resolve to stand strong in your commitment. After all, if everyone else is doing it, some people lack the resolve, the commitment, right, uh, to be able to say no. So again, this is why I applaud Venus Williams. Uh, this site, catholicmatch.com, goes on to say, logically, we know this must include a lot of religious people whose religion teaches them to wait until marriage. However, if you're listening to this, there's a very good chance, any of you that are live here tonight, there's a good chance that you fall into the small percentage of us, a very good chance you fall into the small percentage of us who are choosing to wait, all right? So let's explore why 10% of people wait for marriage to have sex, according to this data, and why some decide not to wait to have sex before marriage. So I want to give you three benefits for waiting. Before we get into what the Bible says, before we get into the fact that if we fornicate, there's potential of damnation, there's judgment. Before we get into any of that, I want to share the three things that, that CatholicMatch.com shared. I am not a Catholic. I don't follow Catholicism. Catholicism has been protested against. That's why we're called uh, uh, we're called uh, Protestant Protestants, right? Because there was a protest against what Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, represents. But just because somebody may not align with your biblical doctrine doesn't mean you can't agree on something. They have to say, okay? Uh, and this is an important thing to remember, all right? So here are the three reasons why, why CatholicMatch.com says uh, there's a benefit to waiting. And I'm going to agree with it, and I'm going to expand on it using the Bible, okay? So number one, relationships improve when you wait to have sex before marriage. Number two, there's less chance of divorce when you wait. To have sex before marriage. And you say, what? Yep, just stay there. We'll get into it. Thirdly, self-control is better, generally speaking, when you wait to have sex before marriage. All right, so number one, relationships improve. How do relationships improve if you wait to have sex before marriage? One of the perks, they say, of waiting is it gives you time to develop good relationships. Women, here is something you need to understand. What you need to understand is one of the most important and the strongest drives, drives of a man is his drive to be sexually intimate with a woman. God has wired the man to be turned on by her shape, right? By she, She's shaped differently for a reason, and that draws him to her. And David is a good example. He's on his roof, or he is in his room. He sees Bathsheba outside bathing. Uh, and she's naked, and David cannot control himself. David, the man after God's own heart, looks at this woman like a piece of meat and has to have her. Okay? So, how do relationships improve? Well, as much as we all want sex, this article says, introducing sex too early in a relationship takes our focus off really getting to know the other person and developing good communication and relationship skills. And this is happening to a lot of people, right? They get they get emotionally connected. They get sexually connected. Now they are emotionally connected to this person, and it's hard to see clearly. It's hard to see their faults. It's hard to see their flaws. See, when you're going to choose to get into marriage, often the person you're going to marry will probably have a lot of the same traits, virtues, values, character traits after I do than they had before I do. And if you believe, you know, if you are too, if you are too involved with them emotionally, right, through the sexual act before marriage, it can cloud your judgment. This is happening to so many people. How many times have you met a woman who got married to a man that she did not like, that she had no interest in, that she was not even attracted to, but he wooed her by his words, by his kindness, by his attention? 
by his affirmations. And what happened? He broke down her guards. He removed her walls. I'm not telling you he did this intentionally. I'm not telling you he was trying to be manipulative. I'm not saying that he did this, that he was conscious of doing this in a manner that lacked integrity. But what I am saying is, once that happens, it's hard for you, once you become one sexually, to see clearly. So, this article goes on to say that sex before marriage can cause couples to use sex as a band-aid to cover up weak areas of their relationships. See, when you are not emotionally connected to someone, you can tell them how you really feel. You can be honest with them. I'm not saying now that, 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 that it's impossible if you've been intimate with someone to do this, but many people lack the ability to be, to be transparent, to be vulnerable, to be honest, to be courageous, to say, no, I don't like that. I don't like this. No, you're wrong here. So they go on to say that the poet Reich wrote, that it, it isn't the, accept, the acceptance of sensual pleasure that is wrong. But the bad thing is that most people misuse and squander this experience and apply it as a stimulant at the tired spots of their lives, and it becomes a distraction. That's a lot of wording to basically say the challenge with sexual intimacy before marriage, the challenge is that it can cloud your judgment. It stops you from being able to see clearly, right? It stops you from being able to think clearly. Eric says, this is not one of my topics, but it matters nonetheless. And I'm assuming, Eric, because you are married already, I think, I don't know. Uh, and I want to say, if you are married, if you are, you know, uh, if you're married already and uh, and you and this topic doesn't relate to you, I'm going to say... Uh, it, it, it relates if you think about the people whose lives you can pour into. There are single people that you can pour into. There are people who are struggling with sexual desire that you can pour into. And that's one of the benefits of us being children of God, right? That the older are to teach the younger, right? There are these principles in scripture that we don't absorb and learn and gain and glean information just for our lives. We also do it so we can be a blessing and a help and an aid to others, uh, whether they're family members or not, right? We want to work with with them. So, uh, I love face. I have no idea who you are. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna have to block you. If you're somebody that I know, you're gonna have to let me know that in some other form. But um, the information you're dropping, I, I can't. I uh, I think it's a huge distraction. Distraction, brother. Slave to Christ says, do you believe in general men or women are? Do you believe in general men? or women are able to practice discipline in regards to sexual desires. Uh, do I believe, I'm, I'm assuming your question is, can men and women uh, discipline themselves in relation to sexual desires? I would say yes. God says flee fornication, and he's not just talking to one gender. He's referring to the body of believers, right? So yes, men and women can be disciplined in this area. Some things may be a little bit harder for others, depending on their background, their experience, their environments, the environment that we put ourselves in. If you look at Joseph, Joseph didn't hang around and speak in tongues when Potiphar's wife dropped, you know, stripped her clothes uh, in front of him. He understood that he was a real man with testosterone, with desire. So what did he do? He flee. He fleed. Right. For lack, that's not a word. He fleed. He ran. Right. So, uh, so we need to walk in wisdom. The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. You and I need to know our weaknesses. We need to know ourselves. We need to be aware of what can be a greater temptation to us uh, so that we can uh, guard ourselves. So, uh, okay, you said meant to say, so do you believe in general men or women are able to practice discipline Right. Or are they meant to practice more discipline? So I think you're asking, uh, is it easier for men or women to practice discipline? I'm going to say it's not easier for either one. I would say, generally speaking, men can be more disciplined when it comes to food and women can be more disciplined when it comes to sex. And this is an important distinction to make. Right. Because a lot of times women lack the ability to empathize with the sexual struggle for the man because he moves by what he sees. 
but she wants the man to understand her ability to maintain her weight because she can't say no to food. And she, she, she generally, and I'm generalizing, can't say no to food because it is an emotional connection. And because she moves emotionally and she's aware of how that food is going to make her feel, generally speaking, what do women generally have to do? And I'm generalizing. They have to move the food out of their environment if they want it. And women, the way you tend to think and feel about food is kind of how men tend to think and feel about you. And so it's hard for the man to have you in his presence desire you and not want to take a bite. And so what God tells the man to do is run, flee, get out of the room, make no provision, get rid of the television, turn it off. Why? Because you're not going to have resolve or discipline to say no in and of yourself because God has wired you to desire that which you see, that which is appetizing. All right. So there's things we have to put in place. So, brother, if that's what you're asking, I'm not going to say that women can be more disciplined than men. I would say that men and women are different in how they apply discipline to their lives. With that being said, there is a no fap movement all across the Internet where where non-Christian men are choosing to not be sexually intimate with women so they could be stronger, have more virtue. Uh, they're, they're choosing not to masturbate, right? That's what the no fat movement is. And these are people that are non-Christian. They're not doing it for religious reasons. They're doing it because they have been taught about all the value, right? And how you can, all the value of not spilling your seed, for lack of a better way. That's a biblical term that's in there. Uh, good question, brother. Good question. I hope I answered your question. Uh, Troy, my brother Troy is here. Good to see you, Troy. Troy says discipline creates character. Discipline creates character. Yeah. We got a lot of amens here. I don't know what the amens are for, so I'm going to skip over them. Uh, Slave to Christ says, I've heard of this too many times. Okay, I think I may have put that up there before. Um, I may have put that up there before. So let's see what else we got. There are some others here that I haven't seen. Uh, Brother Phil says, my Christian friends have a teenage daughter who is also Christian. They allow her to date and kiss. I find that strange. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I think um, the dating issue is a very great area for the body of Christ. It becomes very challenging because people have different levels, right? There's some who believe in courting only. There's others who believe in dating and they have different ideas about what that looks like. So I'll tell you what I applaud and what I find very, it's hard for me to embrace, but I applaud it. When I meet people who've been dating from 14, 15, 16 years old through high school, they were, quote, high school sweethearts, and they're married 20, 30, 40 years later, and they're still in love and committed to each other. When I see that info, that data, I can't argue against it. I have people in my church who have been dating from, quote, from very young, and, um, and it, it worked for them. Now, having four daughters, uh, I've had to wrestle through this issue. And uh, my older daughters now are 26 and 25. And when they were teenagers, I my mindset and my wife's mindset was, you don't date. We you don't you don't go out with someone unless you see them as a potential for marriage. And the way this kind of worked is it's the idea of courting, right? Like when I chose my wife, Deborah, I didn't date other people unless I felt they could be marriage material. Well, how do you do that if you don't really know someone, right? So the experts in quotes tell us that you need to go out and, 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 and get to know other people. Maybe you got to sleep around, do whatever you got to do so you can find out if that's the right person. And that is not working from the, the data and the results that we're seeing. So how do you do this thing that I've, that we did and that we believed? Well, the way you do it is you do it in groups, right? You hang out with people in groups and you and you get to know them in group settings so you eliminate the potential for unnecessary temptation. Now, having two younger girls now, two adopted girls, they're 14 and 10, my thinking is a little bit different now. I'm starting to think through things a little bit different. My 14-year-old, I told her that maybe at 16, she can start dating, but the criteria is I need to meet the guy first. If he has interest in you, dad needs to meet him. 
Dad needs to vet him. Dad needs to make sure he understands that dad will hold him accountable for the way he deal with, treat, talk to, and handle my bride, my daughter, my bride, my daughter, right? Right? There's nothing more hurtful, I think, than a dad pouring his life and energy and time into his daughter in some creep, some bum, some low life, for lack of other terms, comes and just destroys all of that, right? And uh, so, um, brother, I understand. I think people have to walk out and live out their conscience. I do think I've seen families where they were too rigid and kids just rebelled. And so I think when you're going to deal with guidelines and boundaries, which are necessary, what's also critical is it should be done in an environment of love and kindness and gentleness, meekness, tenderness, also transparency and vulnerability. It is wrong for me to tell my children, you can't do blah, 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 blah. I did all those things without telling them, you know what, dad lived this way. And here are the results of dad living this way. And this is why I'm, I'm encouraging you to do differently. Also, I didn't know the Bible like I know it now. And so I think it's important for parents, if you are going to have some guidelines, you need to be transparent. So Brother Phil, I understand. And uh, yeah, I could see how it's strange. Again, I don't know if it depends on how you define a date. If a date means, you know, we're going going out to a movie or we're going skating or whatever. I think a lot of that has to do with the maturity of the child. And uh, I'm wrestling through right now with my younger daughters thinking through, are they disciplined enough? Are they, do they have a fear of God on their own that if they're put in, in an environment that they can say no, right? And so I think we need the wisdom of God and we need to pray about these things. And more importantly than just having rigid guidelines, I'm going to say it's probably very important to know your children individually. Some children are more easily influenced than others. Uh, I know that with my children. Um, and so uh, you really need the wisdom of God and if you choose to say my daughters cannot date or my sons cannot date, you know, I think you need to make it clear to them what that means. And just know that uh, I, I, I'm embracing now that I want you to get to know different people, uh, but there needs to be some guidelines and boundaries set in place. That's insane, Phil. Jesus loves you, says. Now, I don't know if you're saying it's insane, that, that Phil's view is insane because he called it strange. Or if you're saying it's insane, are they allowed to date and kiss? Yeah, I think I think the kissing stuff for a teenager is, I think that's not only insane, that's very foolish because you're not fleeing fornication. And what you're doing by kissing, right, and these other things is you are allowing, um, you are stimulating in areas where you don't need to and you can create unnecessary temptation. And if that guy, that boy is wired like the average boy, it's generally many boys, it's hard to stop at a kiss. And so girls are very naive and not understanding how men and, and males are wired. Um, I was talking to a friend recently who, uh, who uh, was uh, at, a, uh, you know, at an event recently with a guy and this guy was kept hugging up on her like three or four times, but it was in the midst of a, a conversation and, 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 uh, they were, they were sharing some things that, that they were going through and he was going through and she felt compassion for him. Uh, but, but I saw through the side of my eye, the way he was hugging her uh, looked like it was more than a hug. And it was one after another, it was like three or four back to back. And I share with her, I'm like, he likes you. She's like, no, nah, he doesn't. I'm like, he likes you. And, uh, you know, uh, the next day we were talking and she recalled that the guy had said to her a number of years ago that uh, there's been, let's just say there's more than 10 times in her presence where she thought he was just a friend, right? Male, female friend, that she thought he was just a friend. And there were more than 10 times that he said in the past, he wanted to just kiss her. He didn't do it. He respected her. Uh, he was afraid probably of the consequences. So women, you're, you're, you're a little bit naive. If, you're, if you think men think the way you do, see the way you do, hear the way you do, desire the way you do, I think you're naive. We're wired totally different, right? If Solomon can have a thousand women, 700 wives, 
and 300 concubines, I don't know any woman that I know that could feel comfortable, quote, loving more than one man. Yet Moses did it. Abraham did it. David did it. These are men of God. Okay, How can these men compartmentalize their life in such a way that they can show love for more than one woman at the same time? Because they're made differently. Now, that's polygamy, right? It wasn't polygamy under the Old Covenant and in the Old Testament. We're not going to get into that right now. We can't do that today. We have to be husbands of one woman, one wife. But women, to believe that men are wired like you, you are naive at best. And this is why I say to single women, if you are courting or dating or interested in a guy, one of the best things you can do is get another male involved in that relationship. Why? Because he sees differently, hears differently, understands differently, communicates differently, thinks differently. He values different things when he interacts with a guy who is interested in his niece, his daughter, the, the lady that goes to church with him. Right. So Laura says, you're sure, so right. I was in a dating relationship for a few, few years, few years with someone who professes Christ and wasn't convicted of fornication. And he tried to normalize it when I addressed the sin. Women, I'm sad to tell you that um, that that that. Yeah. Lots of Christian men. It's very difficult. Right. And part of the reasons why it's so difficult, ladies, I'm going to say this very quietly. Shh. Why it's so difficult is pornography. Pornography is too accessible. It's too easy. And it changes the male brain. A man's brain is changed by pornography. And so I want to say to you men, young men, older men alike, if you're a Christian, if you're a professing Christian, and you need help in this area, you need to get help. You can't take this for granted because serial killers tell you that they started out with pornography. Uh, we can go down the list of how it changes the brain. It changes appetites. And so what's happening to a lot of Christendom and men in Christendom and women now is because we've been overly sexualized, overly centralized, it's very hard to see someone physically without having to have them. And so, Laura, I'm glad that you uh, recognize that. And uh, it sounds like you had not only the grace but the courage to uh, to uh, to run and to move on um, from that. So um, praise God for praise God for your for your commitment to the truth. Um, brother Brother Eric says purity is so important towards Elohim's grand plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know the power God's power and presence on our life is greater. The Bible says in Proverbs thirty one. If one of you can post for me Proverbs thirty one. Uh, King James Bible, please. I want to share this, and then we'll get back to some practical stuff. Proverbs 31. If you can post for me, verse 3 and verse 4. Proverbs 31, verse 3 and 4. I want someone to post that for me. Matter of fact, uh, if I can get to it before you guys, I will. Let's see. Proverbs 31, 4 and 5. Um, I, want to, I want to highlight what our brother just said. Purity is so important to Elohim. Elohim would be God. Uh, his grand plan, right? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, give me a second. Let me see if I can, if I can post that myself. Uh, let's see. I want to share this text with you. Um, just, it just emphasize the, emphasizes again the importance of staying pure. It's hard to be pure. Um, it's hard to be pure. It's hard to be pure even in marriage. Why? Because uh, it's it, everywhere you go, you know, everywhere you go, male or female, there's opportunities. Uh, everyone is about how they look today. And so uh, it's so important for God's people to be honest about the fight and the battle. And I love I, I love the, the language of the battle, the language of the Bible more than I do. Uh, then I like the idea of struggle. I don't use the word struggle. I like the word fight. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. So the two verses that I'm going to share with you in light of what Brother Eric said here, that purity is so important to God, right, and to his plan, more importantly, right? It's not like God is punishing us uh, when he gives us these admonitions. He's not punishing us by doing this. 
What he's doing is he's protecting his will, his work, his plan. So you are so totally correct, brother. And uh, you guys have a lot of comments here. I am going to jump on them um, in a moment. Uh, so here's a text. Proverbs 31 verse 3 says, Don't give your strength, men, unto women. The word strength there is virtue. The word strength there is, you remember when the woman had the issue of blood and Jesus touched the hem, she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and then he said, who touched me? Why did he say that? Because he, because virtue left him. Well, this is what Lemuel's mother is saying to him as a king. She said, there are two things that destroys kings, women and alcohol. And she says, don't give your strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. A lot of Christians are arguing about whether we have Christian liberty to drink or not. And I say Jesus did not turn water into Kool-Aid. He turned water into wine. The Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess. That seems to imply that Christians can drink wine. But those that are in authority are given admonition, right? An elder should not be given, a pastor should not be given to wine. But this gives us wisdom, right? King Lemuel's mother is not even saying it is a sin to drink wine or strong drink. She's saying that because you are a king, because you are a royal priesthood, you are a chosen person of God, leader, right? You're a leader. Don't give your strength to that which is going to weaken you, that which is going to destroy your virtue, that which is going to stop you from being able to say no or resist temptation. And that's the idea that's that's there. So this is a great text to memorize. And uh, I would say that uh, that 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 you should, if you're, especially if you are a man. So brother, brother Eric, purity is so important towards Elohim's grand plan. Yes, you and I will be much more powerful. We'll have more anointing on our life, more of the spirit of God working in our life when we can resist sexual temptation. It is one of the most difficult things to resist, but when we can, God's presence and power is made available in a very, very unique way. So my brother says, purity equals holiness. Yes, yes, yes. And without it, no one shall see the Lord. Eric says, sanctification starts with a willing mindset. Yes, it does. We're going to talk about some scriptures in a moment. Latanya says, I agree with that, the transparency. Yep, transparency is also very important. Eric says, single believers need to still themselves to find fine-tuning themselves to his spirit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, wouldn't argue with there with you there, brother. So um, great. Let's see. I am going to look at what other comments are here. So let me get back to what I want to uh, say here. And um, uh, right. So the first thing is uh, that I think you want to be mindful of. And again, this comes from that article from Catholic Catholic uh, Catholic Match. I think it is. Let's let's remember what what what. Yeah, CatholicMatch.com. Uh, the, one of the benefits of, of denying yourself, right, of saying no to, to sexual temptation before marriage is it improves your relationship. Because, see, you're not building that relationship on intimacy only, sexual desire only. Why? Because those things can tend to cloud your judgment. All right. And, um, yeah, so we got to walk in wisdom there. And I, I agree with the points of this article. Secondly, uh, they go on to say that there's less chance for divorce. Couples who wait to have sex until marriage and remain abstinent while dating are less likely to get divorced. And you say, how is that the case? Well, this may fly in the face of modern rationale for sexual exper ex experimentation and living together before becoming newlyweds. Yet research has consistently shown that the fewer sexual partners one has before marriage, the less likely they are to experience divorce. See, a lot of people have all sorts of reasons why they have divorce. But guys, let me give you a nugget of wisdom here. If you are not sexually satisfied by your partner, everything else in that relationship can be amplified. So you may say, I am leaving my relationship because... A, B, C, D, E. 
but you've not connected it to the fact that you have had intimacy with others before, making it more difficult for you to be content and satisfied, at least in this one area with your spouse. And so you may be angry with your spouse or have strife and contention because of money issues, parenting issues, communication issues. And I'm saying to you that every one of those issues get more amplified when there is not enjoyment in the marriage bed. They all get amplified. And sadly, you may not be even able to recognize it because it's subconsciously there. You see, when that area is good, it makes it easier for other areas. Women, you can know where your husband stands if he's willing to be intimate with you, generally. Especially, and men, you can know where your wife stands if she's willing to be intimate with you. She's not Generally, she's not going to be intimate with you if she's bitter, if she's resentful, if she's angry. And so sexual intimacy in a marriage is a good measurement for the attitude of the couple, where they are. Are they choosing to submit themselves to what God says or to what they feel? All right. So uh, I'm, I'm looking through some of your quotes here. Um, you know, let's see. All right. I'll try to put them there as I think they make sense. So, again, the data does show that fewer sexual partners, partners before marriage leads to less likeliness of divorce after marriage. You have nothing to compare. You have no one to compare them to. So once you're building from the ground up, right, you only have that relationship, generally speaking. I'm not, not saying maybe you didn't, you didn't do dating, but getting becoming intimate with somebody looks different than just going out to eat, going to a movie, right? Uh, uh, what people would call dating. I don't even know what dating looks like anymore, right? Because it's I've had 27 years of a marriage. So, um, yeah, I, I can't speak with any real authority on that because it's been a long time. So, so, so one of the benefits, one of the benefits of abstaining is relationships improve because you're not building a relationship on sexual attraction alone. That's an important reason, I think, to build a relationship. It's not the only relation, not the only reason, especially if you're a child of God, right? You want to start with things that are priority based on scripture. But secondly, there's less chance of divorce. A lot of data on this, you can research it on your own. Right. I think this is why so many people find it hard to be content with their spouse. They have too many other people to compare to. And those of you that understand the Bible, the scripture makes this makes it clear that two people become one flesh when they are sexually engaged. Even without a marriage ring or covenant, they become you lose a part of yourself once you become once you you're intimate with all these different partners. You're leaving a part everywhere you go. Right. A lot of people don't understand this. And I'm not saying that it makes it any easier, but it's something that we should be able to think about. Lastly, lastly, uh, self-control, all right? A good way to know that someone is self-controlled is they're able to say no before marriage to sex, right? And here's the truth. If you're not controlled in one area, there's a chance that you won't be controlled in other areas. So saving sex for marriage is a good practice in self-control. We live in a culture that is that is rife with instant gratification. Everything we want or need, we can have immediately and conveniently. However, there are good reasons to exercise self-control. This is a virtue and a skill you will need all your married life. Contrary to what many single people believe, married people do not get to have sex whenever they want. Now, I am happy to say, as I said to you guys, my wife, anytime I wanted sex, even when she was sick, she would make herself available, even up to the end. And I said, nope, I don't. I, you're, you know, you, um, I praise God for your ability to deny yourself and, uh, and wanting to fulfill your husband's needs. But I need to show you that I have self-control as well. Right? So. There are many reasons to abstain even after marriage, such as uh, child spacing, right? You may decide you don't want to have a bunch of children right away, um, right? If you don't believe in birth control, which I don't. I believe there's a lot of side effects to birth control. 
I don't want to get into that now, but there's there's no medication you can put in your body that does not have some impact on the body, right? There's a reason the Bible calls sorcery pharmakia in the Greek, in the book of Revelation. So be careful, right? There's some things we have to put in our body, you know, to deal with pain, deal with other issues, but you also want to walk in wisdom and be aware of the side effects of everything that you're putting in your body. So there are many, many reasons to abstain, even after marriage. Some do it for child spacing. And I don't want to debate with you on whether your th- what your thoughts are on that. That's not the purpose of this right now. There's illness, right? My wife was sick for many, many times during our marriage, which meant I could not be intimate with her, all right? What happens if you don't have any self-control? There's times of being apart. The Bible talks about giving yourself to fasting and prayer. That's 1 Corinthians 7, right? So learning to find other ways to express love and affection while exercising self-control is a beautiful gift that you can give to your future marriage, okay? So these are just some practical things to think about as you think about this issue. Let me get into a couple things related to the Bible. Do you guys have any comments or thoughts? Anybody want to come live? If you want to drop, if you want to come live, drop a three, drop a three in the in the chat, and I'll be happy to bring you on. If you want to come live, either with a question, I'm going to hang out for a few more minutes, or with a comment. All right, um, you know, I I'd be more than happy to bring you up. Uh, so drop a three in the chat, and I'd be happy. Brother Eric says, um, any intimacy prior toward prior to marriage marriage leads needs solid repentance over. Yeah. Brother, you have a way with the English language and the way with the words, but I get what you're saying. You know, uh, I think he's saying there if you if you've been intimate outside of marriage with someone before marriage and you want to please God, then you need to repent, right? And what is repentance? Repent repentance is a change of heart that leads to a change of way. But repentance affects three areas: it affects our thoughts about the action, our deeds about the action, and our words about the action. When you have repented, it's not just a change of mind and a change of heart. John the Baptist said to the religious leaders of his day, he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, quote, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. If your repentance is genuine, genuine, I want to see it in your deeds. When Zacchaeus had repented of stealing from others, The way he showed his repentance was not just that he had a change of mind or change thought or change heart about the issue. That's step one. He also corrected the issue by giving back what he had stolen. This is a truth that's not often taught uh, about repentance, the doctrine of repentance, where repentance is more than change of heart, change of thoughts. It also deals with our actions, if you can correct the issue, and it deals with the way we talk about the issue, right? The way we talk about the issue. So um, I don't see any of you desiring to come up, so I am going to then get into a couple of scriptures, and then I will wrap up tonight. So what does the Bible say about sexual purity, and what does it say about abstinence and celibacy? Well, the Bible uses the word fornication for many forms of sexual activity outside of marriage. And, and, and in this area, God has a standard for his children. Okay. And so I want to just look at a couple passages of scripture as an encouragement to the people of God here tonight. And um, I don't know how many of these verses are going to show up, but we're going to see in a moment. Okay. So we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 2 says, For ye know what commandments, plural, we gave you. Those of you that are teaching people, you're in ministry and you're telling people, because we're not under law, we're under grace, we don't have to obey the commands. We don't have commands to obey. We don't have to obey the law. After all, we're not under the law, we're under grace. We're not under the law of Moses, but we are under the law of Jesus. And the Bible makes it clear. Jesus says, if you love me, quote, keep my commandments. The gospel is a command. 
The gospel is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not an idea. It's not just a declaration. This is why the Bible says that God is coming back. Christ is coming back with his holy angels to judge those who obey not the gospel. The gospel must be obeyed. It is not just to be learned. It is not just to be understood. It is not just to be believed. It requires adjustment of life. It requires me making a choice or decision to do something different. Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 28, I want you to teach them when you go into the world with the gospel, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So if someone is telling you that because we're under grace, we're not to obey, we don't have to obey, we don't have commands, and their idea is because we're not saved by works, that somehow if you are doing, if you are obeying, there's this idea out there that if someone is teaching you to obey God, that they're teaching you works-based salvation. The reason they're saying that is they because they think like Greeks and Romans, and they don't think like Hebrews. See, you would never say obedience is not necessary, keeping of the law is not necessary, if you thought like a Jew, a biblical Hebrew. Why? Because you cannot have faith without obedience. Faith without works is dead. To have faith means that you have to act on the information. So if I said to you, if someone said to me, Sean, do you believe this chair will blow up in 10 seconds? If I say yes and I don't move, I don't believe. If I move, you know I believe because my faith is seen by my action, not by my words, not by my, my, not by my profession, not by my declaration. So I want to emphasize this because here we see, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says to the Thessalonians, we didn't just tell you Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. We didn't just tell you accept Jesus in your heart. We didn't just tell you to repent of your sins and to believe the gospel. We told you under the authority of Jesus Christ we commanded you to do some things. Okay? This is why the Bible says we are to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. That's a command. That's not a suggestion. That's why God says forgive one another. Pray one for another. These are not suggestions. These are commands. Love one another. That's a command, not a suggestion. Paul says, and I'm sorry, my face is not going to show. You probably don't need to see me anyway. For you know... Let's see if I can do this another way. Uh, I don't think I can. For you know what commandments, plural, we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, I am, I am sharing with you, there is great authority in what I'm about to say. Because it's by the Lord Jesus Christ that I've given you these commands. And what is it? For this is the will of God, quote, even your sanctification. A lot of times Christians are like, I don't know what the will of God is. Well, part of the will of God is that we are set apart from the world, from sin, from sinners unto God, right? It is the will of God, our sanctification. And what is that, if you're not clear? That you should abstain from fornication. That you should avoid sexual sin. That you should abstain. This is the will of God. This is commanded by God. This is the desire of God for all of his children. That we should abstain from fornication. Verse 4. That every one of you, every one of you, not some of you, that every one of you should know, excuse me, how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That means uh, that, uh, <laughs> that you're not going to use your organs in the wrong way. Right, that you can be set apart to God. Each person should know how to possess possess their vessel in sanctification and honor. There are some things that are dishonorable that people can do with their bodies. God says, "A child of God." And again, in the first century, sex sex was a big thing then, just as as it is now. All right, and uh, so I don't want to become too detailed here, but. He says that they should not possess their vessel in lust of con 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 uh, concupiscence, that's sexual sin on steroids, <laughs> that has the idea of 
uh, desires with greed out of control, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. What is he saying here? Those that know God should know how to live differently from those that don't know God. Why? Because they have been commanded by God to live a certain way. They've been commanded by God to live a certain way. All right. Let me give you another passage of scripture. All right. So, so that's First Thessalonians chapter 4. It's a good text to memorize. And the fact that God says that we should know how to possess our vessel with honor and we should know how to abstain says that this is something we should be taught. And the fact that we have to abstain shows that our will needs to be engaged. It shows that if you are waiting until you feel like doing it, you, you probably will never do it. All right? So the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. That means I have to put in effort. This was one of the greatest struggles for me as a younger Christian and as a single Christian. I carried a lot of guilt because I, I the desires were still there, and I wanted the desires to go away. And I, I have to admit to you tonight that I prayed before I was married that God would take away my sexual desires because I kept falling into temptation. And I said to my wife after I was married that if I did not have sexual desire, I would never have been married because I felt I could be more effective as a single, as a Christian, as a single, if I didn't have an appetite for sexual intimacy. This text says again, right? I'm going to just give you the one text. Sorry, I'm, I, I'm not even in the live. Sorry, guys. I'm missing all your comments. Forgive me. I was in this different section here. But this is the text I want to leave you with as we think about this. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, your being set apart, that you should abstain, which shows our will needs to be engaged, that shows that we have to choose to do it. If you're waiting to feel like doing it, I'm telling you the feelings don't go. You have to act. I, I, um, you know, I used to pastor at a church where my co, my fellow pastor, fellow elder, was almost 80 years old. And he said to me that he still had to abstain. He still struggled. He still had to fight. He still dealt with those desires. If you have this mentality that somehow the desires go away for a male or female after you say I do, or the desires go away after you are old or after you get older, you are probably sadly mistaken. Okay? So, so developing discipline, I think, can be extremely helpful. Extremely helpful. Uh, brother Mike says, Hi, hey, bro brother, God bless you. All right. Thank you, brother. I am blessed and uh, glad to be blessed. Slave, to, slave of Christ says, justification of works is in the context of vindication, affirmation, and proving of one's faith through demonstration. That's his way of saying uh, we're not justified by works. We're justified by faith. But if our faith is real, it will have works attached to it. Right. We're not we're not we can't merit salvation by being good enough because our goodness does not add to God. And there's none good anyway. Right. Any goodness that you and I show is a reflection of the character of God uh, in our lives. So uh, this brother says he says, yo, strong to prosper. OK, so a brother saying hello. All right. So so that's one text I want to give you. Uh, brother Mike, I'd love to bring you on live. Uh, you, um, if you're okay with being transparent about what things were like for you before you said I do, you got married pretty late. I believe, you know, if you're willing, give me a three, brother, in the chat, and I'll drop the link for you. Matter of fact, I'm just going to go ahead and drop this link if Brother Mike is willing to come up. Again, I don't know if you're on the road. I don't know if you, um, if you are in front of your computer. And so... Um, I am going to take a chance here, and if, if you can't come up, that's totally fine. I'm going to drop the link in the chat, and I'd love to have a 10-minute chat with you, brother, because I believe, uh, you know, you had a long time of abstinence. I think it could be helpful for, for many of God's people that are struggling or fighting uh, with sexual sin and desires in this area. But if you're just jumping on, we've been talking a little bit about Rihanna and, and Venus, Will Venus Williams. Uh, and uh, the contrast and the wisdom of Venus Williams from Sean's perspective over Rihanna. Rihanna is pregnant, out of wedlock, potentially getting married after she has the baby to ASAP Rocky in Barbados. 
Uh, but 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 Venus Williams has chosen to be celibate, chosen to abstain from sex before marriage, chosen to wait until she gets married. She's 41 years old. She's still a virgin. And uh, many of you remember that movie years ago, uh, Virgin Something. Uh, the guy that was a virgin, I think, at 40 years old. Uh, if you watch that movie, uh, Hollywood made fun of him because of his virginity. And that's generally how our culture sees this area. But if you're a child of God, if you desire to please God, you have to be willing to do it God's way because God knows things that we don't know, that you don't know. And you may not have all the data as to why that's a better option. But uh, you need to trust that God is wiser than you are. And uh, God knows God knows best. So Mike, I don't see you. I don't see you coming up here. So I'm assuming you're either not ready or um, whatever. So let me let me let me get into another text as I as I get ready to um, to uh, to wrap up here. Uh, many of you uh, know First Corinthians chapter six. Why is it that the child of God should abstain from sex outside of marriage? Well, there's quite a number of reasons that the Bible gives us. Um, at least one, right? At least one um, is uh, 1 Corinthians 6.18. You notice the instructions regarding sexual immorality? They're very simple. It just says flee fornication. Flee it. Just run from it. Don't stand around. Don't, don't will. Don't have willpower. Don't think you can handle it. Run. Flee fornication. Why? Every sin that a man does is outside the body, without the body involved. If you lie, if you steal, if you cheat, if you commit murder, those things are outside of the body. They are not generally connected to the body in the same way that it can affect the body. But he that commits fornication, he that committed fornication, sinneth against, this text says, against his own body. What? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? So the child of God is described as the Holy Ghost lives within the child of God. The child of God, we have the Holy Ghost within us, right? And um, Mike, I'm going to mute you right now um, until I'm done with this. And then I, uh, it's great to have you. I'm, you have, I want to pull you up. That's going to be great. So don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. So this text says, since I don't belong to myself, I've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, right? He owns me. He owns you. Then that's reason number one, not to fornicate. He's Lord and he owns me. Reason number two, and not in any particular order, when you do have sex outside of marriage with somebody, you become one with them. And now we're joining, as we continue to read, the Holy Spirit to a harlot, to a, another person. And I don't know all the ramifications of this, uh, but the third part is we, we, we then sin against our own bodies, right? So this is very hard, very difficult uh, to avoid, depend, you know, especially in the society and the time in which we live. So Brother Mike, uh, good to see you tonight, man. Mike is, is a good brother. Love Mike. And um, how you doing, man? I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So you yeah. got married at what age? Um, right I'm going right in. Just jumping right in. <laughs> okay. No, I, I was just stopping in for a minute, man. I'm I'm not even sure what the um what the what the topic is. I just saw that you were live. Um, oh. Okay. So so I'm talking about. Well, I was talking tonight about Venus Venus Williams and uh, Rihanna, and how okay. our culture celebrated Venus Williams. I mean uh, Rihanna. Uh, getting pregnant out of wedlock, unmarried, but yet uh, uh, lambasted and knocked and ridiculed on social media, Venus Williams, for being a virgin at 41. Mm. And she said that she would wait until she's married. So I figured I would use this as a springboard to talk a little bit about abstinence, purity, celibacy, right? Sexual purity. And you and I had talked about this a little bit by text. Uh, maybe a week or two ago, right? Maybe two weeks yeah, ago? About yeah. a week ago. Yeah. And I planned to, to do something with you separate, live, but since I saw you online, I figured, let me pull you in and we can talk a little bit because I think it can be helpful to people that are challenged and are struggle, struggling in this area. All right, so are you willing to go for the ride for 10 minutes? Uh, sure. Okay, you trust me, don't you? 
Yeah, man. Awesome, awesome. All right, so number one, so just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. How do you and I know each other? Um, that doesn't have to be long. That's I don't even know if I should even ask you that question, but how do we know each other? Let's start there so we can warm you up a little bit as rather than me going right into your situation. Okay. Um, so basically, um, Sean and I had met, I want to say about, uh, actually about eight years ago this week, I believe it was, because I think I met you the week before the Super Bowl back in 2014. Okay. You yeah. Know, me, brother. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, I was actually um, going to like um, a big church at the time. And, um, you know, I was just struggling at that church and, um, you know, just was not growing at that church. Um, just had a lot of different challenges with that church at the time. And um, um, there was a brother, a mutual friend of ours that was actually connected to the church that you were um, pastoring at that had invited me to come out. And um, I had met you and then um, I was visiting that church on and off for about um, maybe like a little over a year. And then um, eventually I left that big church and then I came and joined uh, the church where you were pastoring at. And, um, you know, we've been tight and close ever since. Yeah. And you've become a good friend, right? You and your wife. And I've had the privilege, my wife and I, to uh, mentor you guys a little bit. I'm not going to take much credit there, but well, let's just say we spent a lot of time together and we had a lot of conversations about marriage and Yes. A lot of conversations about whether you're going to find the one is when it's going to happen. And I think I remember telling you the year that you you chose your bride that I did I say like this year was going to be the year or something. I don't remember. It's so funny. I want to say <laughs> this was this was like back in like March of 2016. It was about a month before I had left for Israel. Yes. And um, I was actually in the process of. Um, I had just, I, I think I was, um, I was talking to like another young lady and things were just kind of like, like on and off with her. And, mm -hmm. and it was just a frustrating situation for me. And, um, and, um, I remember we had talked about it and then, um, you know, you had, um, recommended just, you know, moving on from that situation. And then, um, I remember I was actually at the gym and then you said you felt, mm -hmm. that you felt like an impression. And um, that's when you had shared that with me. And lo and behold, uh, <laughs> later that year, the end of that year, um, December 2016 is when I um, I formally met my bride. Yeah. So so uh, I'm not. You, would you describe me as a charismatic? Um, I think you're pretty balanced. Yeah. Right. In my, so, my, my opinion, my interaction. Do I, do, I, do, I give, do I walk around giving prophecies? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, 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 but, but, but it is balanced, right? Because many in my tradition have the mentality that God has stopped speaking, that God doesn't speak anymore, only through his word. And what Mike said is there's a period after a number of years with him that I felt an impression. I felt of the Lord that this was going to be his year. And the reason he could give weight to that is number one, this is not how I normally speak. Number two, it's not how I interacted with him on a regular basis. See, sometimes people will use, quote, prophecy or impressions or, quote, words from the Lord to manipulate people, to have dom dominion over people, to have authority over their faith and over their life, right? And so, guys, you got to be very careful. The Bible says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. But because I don't believe the gifts have ceased, right, I believe they're still operating today. I, I, I define them differently than many in our culture do today, and much of the word of faith and charismatic movement does, and how those gifts are are handled, used, operated with, right? But yeah, I told Mike that I felt this was going to be the year, and uh, it became the year that he met his bride. And um, um, so you had gone how long? Uh, you know, how long before? Let's talk a little bit about the singleness. What that was like. What was it like being single as a Christian? First of all, you were intimate before Christ, right? With women. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about what what the what 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 kind of challenges you felt as as much as you feel comfortable with, and as prudent as you can, and with with discretion. Um, I'd say what more discretion is a better word. Um, what, what what was it like um, being a Christian, 
having experienced intimacy with women, and now you are being taught by the Bible to abstain until marriage. What was that like for you? And did you ever get to a point where you felt, uh, this, I'm wasting my time here, and I'm never going to get married? Let's talk about those a little bit. Um, so what's interesting is, um, right, you know, before I actually came to the Lord, um, I came to the Lord, I started my journey back in 2005. And I would say I officially, um, it was like a process of like being born again and conversion for me. So, um, but prior to that, um, I had already knew that basically, um, God was against premarital sex and fornication and stuff, but, um, you know, but um, in the back of my mind, you know, um, not being converted, you know, my flesh, you know, got the better of me. And of course, I, you know, I reasoned with that and um, and it was I guess it was OK at that point. But, um, you know, once I came to the Lord, um, you know, it was just a lot of uh, different situations that were going on in my life at the time. And um, ultimately, um, I just wanted peace in my life. I just wanted peace in my life. I, mm. I, and that peace that I was looking for is actually the peace of God, just that peace that just surpasses all understanding. Mm. And um, I remember just laying in my bed one morning, just feeling um, just pathetic and just out of it and stuff. And, mm. and the Holy Spirit, you know, I, I always point to that scripture in Revelation that, um, you know, when he's knocking on the door of your heart, you open yeah. it, and he'll and he'll come into you, and you, and you be with him. You'll suffer right. him. Right, Revelation. I, okay. Yeah, I had I didn't know the scripture at that time, but when I look back at it, that was the type of moment that I had. So, I just said, okay, I know what I have to do. You know, I'm you know I'm gonna be all in now. And right. um, two of the things that I knew that definitely needed to go, um, I guess like the the quote unquote traditional sins were. Um, basically fornicate <clears throat> fornication and drunkenness hmm. um, which were i want to say two two of my major sins of choice back in the day before i came to the lord now let me ask you how much time and i don't i'm not doing this as a license for anybody right but mm -hmm. I, i'd like to provide context so how much time between your profession of faith in christ to you coming to this conclusion this point where you're like you know what i need to now like cut these things off and take my walk with God to another level. What would that, what did that window look like? Well, I would say um, from the time that I started that journey um, and, you know, not to get graphic or anything like that. Um, I, I actually stopped sexual intercourse at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I would what say. I, probably, what I'm asking is you make a profession of faith. You're following Christ. Yes. But you still have this battle going on. How long did, it, did that battle happen until you decided, I'm, I'm cutting this off, I'm putting this to death, and I'm going to be faithful to God? Um, I want to say probably probably about almost a year. Okay. So it wasn't, uh, and I thought you were going to say many, many years, right? So no. that's, that's good. So you went about a year, you were still growing in grace, you were learning the scriptures, you were coming face to face with what God expects you to be and do, right? You're putting on the new man. You're renewing your mind. And now you come to this point where you realize this is how God expects me to live. You make a decision now. I'm going to do it God's way, not my way. Yeah. Yes. So tell me, tell, talk, let's talk a little bit about what that was like once you made that decision and how did you deal with the struggle and the temptation? Because uh, I, I think you went, what, about 13 years of abstinence yeah. uh, until you were married, right? Um, I would say 13 years without intercourse, maybe about 12 years without fooling around. Okay. So I didn't, yeah. I didn't talk about fooling around. I meant this, I'm talking about yeah. the sexual activity, but you wanted to yeah. identify the fooling around. Now you leave that ambig ambiguity there. People have all sorts of ideas. So you're talking about kissing by holding hands. How far is that yeah. going? You know, because, because the Lord, because the Lord said that if you even lust after a woman in your heart, you know, you already, you committed adultery. So that's why I'm, I want to be specific with that. That's good. So you, you had a year, so 12 years, no sexual intercourse, but, but, uh, uh and a year where you still doing things that 
was motivated by lust in your heart. You didn't do the physical act fully. Thanks for making that connection. Uh, I do believe I, you can hold someone's hand without being filled with lust. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not, right? not that, I'm not going with that extreme. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Okay. So but, I didn't think, the, I, I didn't what, connect it. I didn't connect it to Matthew five, looking at a woman to lust. I was thinking, okay, maybe you held hands. You know, there's a point before Deborah and I were married that we just decided we couldn't even we we didn't want to do, you know, intimate kissing or anything because that was only gonna create generate more desires to do more. And which is weird because she was she had not been with a guy before. Right. Okay. So you would think it would have been easier for her, but uh, it wasn't that didn't make it any easier as far as I can tell. So uh, anything else you want to share about that? So so how did you what did you actually do uh, to help you uh, maintain your abstinence? 13 years sounds like a long time to many people. You know what? I just I just um, I knew eventually I was going to, you know, meet meet a young lady and eventually I was going to get married. But in the meantime, I was just, just focused on the Lord. And, um, you know, um, the Lord was able to, um, gift me with just that, with that peace inside where, um, you know, I mean, of course, you know, um, you know, I'm still, still attracted to women and, you know, and I'm, you know, as, really? a, as a man, after, as after a, marriage, after marriage, huh? <laughs> After no, marriage. no, I'm, talk, I'm talking about that period of time. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, but, um, you know, the Lord just, um, he just gave me, you know, just gave me strength where, honestly, I didn't really have the desire to, um, to you know, go after women at that time. Like, I was mm -hmm. just more focused on him. Um, you know, my eyes were always open in the event that, um, you know, he wanted to bless me with, um, with with that wife you know but um you know like um I, I i had stopped going to places where i might be compromised mm -hmm. um i had stopped uh going to clubs i had you know stopped going to parties i stopped going to you know events that i used to go to when i was in the world um and i just had more of a desire for the lord and i just focused on the lord um i just you know like you know in first corinthians 7 it talks about he who's single focuses on the things of the Lord, and then he who, who's married, you know, focuses on his wife. You mm. know, so I just, um, you know, I, I mean, I literally took that to heart. Like I was just, just, felt completely um, focused on the Lord, and if, um, if he brought somebody like before me who might be a potential wife for me, you know, um, you know, I would ask questions, I would explore, you know, I might go out you know, on maybe like a date or get a cup of coffee or something like that. But that's about as far as it went. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, I wasn't, I was not burning with lust. Um, I want to say like during, during that period. Yeah. Um, but I would say um, probably, you know, once I met my wife, um, then I had, then I had realized that, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was time. It was time. And I was moving towards that period where I was going to have to say, I, I do. Right. And, um, you know, I, I felt like that grace was starting to run out. You know what I mean? That he, that he gave me during that period of time. And also I had, I had, um, basically, you know, formed the rule in terms of, you know, some of the wisdom the Lord gave me. Right. Okay. Like, um, like it's almost like my peripheral vision. I could be at the gym or I could be someplace where, you know, it might, be attractive women and stuff like that. And, and it's almost like I, I could like catch like a quick glimpse of them. And immediately it's like, I would look the other way or I wouldn't walk towards that way, you know? And, um, and I would just, you know, just avoid that situation. That's good. You know, so so I got, wrong. I got five things from what you said, uh, that, um, five things you did, right. That, that uh, that helps you. Some practical steps. So I'm going to run through them real quick, and I think these can be helpful to others. So the first thing you said is you had hope, all right? And I believe, and you correct me if I'm wrong here. You had there was hope, right? For those of you that don't know hope, hope in the Bible is not like I hope I will see you tomorrow. It's a confident expectation that you're going to receive what you're believing for. 
So you had hope, right? You had this confident expectation that this was going to be temporary, that there was going to come a point where you would find a wife and be able to get married. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Like I was just focusing on the Lord. Right. So because you knew that this was would be temporary and one day you were going to get married, that gave you strength in the moment. The Bible says because of the joy that was set before Christ, he endured the cross. Right. Why did he have joy? Because that confident expectation that the cross would mean Sean and Mike's salvation gave Jesus the power in one sense as the son of man in time to endure the difficulty because he knew that the persevering through that season would have an outcome. So the first thing I hear you saying is because you had hope that this was not going to be a lot for the rest of your life and you would not be spending the rest of your life struggling against sexual temptation, that that gave you the power to be able to resist and to persevere. Secondly, you said you made no provision for the flesh. You started changing places you would go. You'd stop going to bars or different places. I think some of the terms you use or anything that would stir up your desires, right? So the second principle is no provision for the flesh. Was there ever a period of time, Mike, where you had to shut off or get rid of your television because that may have triggered certain things for you? What's interesting is that um, when um, when I was in the process of weaning those things um, out of my life, because it wasn't completely, completely cold turkey, but it's almost like any time that, um, you know, like say if, um, if I had went to, um, say, like a club just to, you know, maybe I might have been with, with like a friend or um, or the, the organization. I used to be part of a secret society. I, I've denounced that ever since then. If um, if I was, you know, with them, like I would go to, I would be in the club. And honestly, I'd be miserable. Mm. I'd be absolutely miserable. And it's like, and it's like, because my heart was changing so much in the Lord and like, and I was starting to hate what he hated. Mm. So, so he, so he, t- so, so because, you know, the Bible says when you submit to God, the devil will flee. He says that what in James chapter four, seven. Yes. So, so I was submitting to God and, um, and then basically like, I feel like the, the devil was fleeing from, from trying to influence or manipulate my heart. Amen. And um and my 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 desires became like you know became God's desires for my life and um and when I was miserable, I I did everything I could to to avoid um those situations um not be and not only because I had to because I wanted to right I get that so that so that's even a bonus when you when you want to like live for God. Well, I think it's a diff it's a good difference between the fear of God and the love of God, right? We need both mm-hmm. of them in our lives. We need to fear yeah. God and we need to grow in our love for God. And uh, in the beginning, uh, it's the fear of God generally that's motivating us to, to obey. But, uh, but, but you've identified that your, your desires change, right? And it's like, Joseph, how can I do this thing and sin against God? I don't think it was just, quote, the fear of God that was governing and controlling him. I think Joseph's love for God was so mature and so strong that he did not want to grieve God. He did not want to disappoint him, right? So so that's good to hear, Mike. So first you have this hope, and I love the direction that you've laid it out because it looks like a like we have this plan, these good practical steps, because that's how I see it when I look at the words. So the second thing you did is you made no provision for the flesh. So you look for those areas where you could be more tempted than others, and you eliminated them. You began to remove them. And you found that the more you resisted the devil and you said no to temptation, the, the easier it got to resist and the more the Lord empowered you so you could resist or the more his grace was sufficient to persevere. The third thing you said you did is you changed your focus. You changed your focus. And what I hear you saying by that is instead of focusing, I'm going to add this. I don't know that this is what you were saying, but I think it can be helpful. You didn't just focus on eliminating temptation, eliminating provision, provisional opportunities to sin, eliminating sexual sin. 
you turn and begin to focus on God and Bible things and spiritual things, right? Am I correct in how I understood that? And, and looking at these steps, I would say yes. And um, I would say change focus and, um, and pursuing Christ, I would say they go hand in hand. Right. Right. The reason I separate them, because one of them to me is repentance, right? You're changing what you are going to focus on, right? As you've heard me say many times, that which we focus on gets what? Do you remember? Gets bigger, uh, right? Yeah. That's right. So yeah. if you spend all your energy focusing on the struggle or the fight against sexual sin, that sometimes can look bigger than God himself. That sometimes can look bigger than God's grace and God's power that's made available to us to resist and to say no. So the reason I separated them is I wanted to identify that this is an also this also is a step. There is a step of repentance, right? From dead works and then faith in God. We see a person turning from something and then putting their effort and their energy into Christ. And so when I look at step four, you said and then you pursued Christ. So you're seeking first God's kingdom, but you are also Doing Colossians 3 1, you are setting your affection on things above. And Amen. this is where many lose, right? If all we do, guys, is put to death the old man, but we don't add to our faith, we stay in that vacuum of struggle. And the Bible says, when a unclean spirit goes out of a man, here's the principle when the strong man is bound, but you don't fill the room with other and alternative desires that the the demonic forces powers the influence come back even stronger so so what i the reason i separated it mike and you know wisdom is my thing right it's my brain it's how my brain works the lord mm -hmm. you know, that's what he does i can't explain it so the way i hear the words you said is we de then need to set our affection on things above we, it's not yeah. enough to to remove the temptations eliminate the provision it's not enough to develop our hope that this is this is not this is not the lot for the rest of my life. Someday I'm going to be married. Uh, or someday I'm going going to be able to get rid of the struggle. I got to tell you, man, there's times before I was married that I thought I'm going to struggle with this thing for the rest of my life. And I'm never going to be able to. I'm never going to have a, a peaceful moment. That's mm. how enslaved I was, you know, before Christ. Uh, brother, uh, Sister Laura says this is an encouraging conversation. Well, thank you, sis. So my labor was not in vain. <laughs> right, it was not in vain. All right, so we change our focus, right? Then we pursue Christ. We get intentional about loving Him, pursuing Him, feeding on the Word of God. Mike, during this season, what was your devotional life like? Um, I basically just read. Oh man, I'm trying to remember. Like early on, um, I would listen to like a lot of a lot of sermons and I would go over like a lot of notes and I would go back and listen to those sermons at least a couple of times a week. Wow. Um, I want to say this was like right before um, I started to like, like um, really dig deep into the Bible on my own. Yes. And, um, and I would like actually just read maybe like a chapter a day, but I used to have like the, um, like a study, like a study Bible. Yes. That would like help me, you know, um, interpret like what some of the scriptures and stuff actually meant right. or it'd be like a lot of commentary in it. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Well, how did, how did our fellowship group help you, if any, in relation to this area? Because a lot of Man. people don't realize how important it is to be connected to a local body, to be connected to accountability, to be connected to other people that would spur you on because you're around people that are pursuing Christ loving the Lord, denying themselves. Talk a little bit about the fellowship group uh, for those that may not have that type of experience to look at. Uh, what what was that like and, and how did that assist or help you in your desire to remain pure before God? Oh, boy. Um, like, you know, it, it talks about it talks about an Acts two. How like um, how like um, they they all they all broke bread and held steadfast to the teaching of the apostles' doctrine. They broke bread and had all things in common and, and gladness and singleness of heart. And I would say 
um, when I first started coming to that fellowship group, when I first joined the church um, and, and was part of that fellowship group, um, that's what I experienced just about every single Sunday. Um, we would go to church in the morning. We would have, um, you know, we would have um, Sunday school. We would have the service. We would come back to your house or, or um, you know, one of the, um, the deacons um, that, um, that was part of that church as well. And um, basically, we would just break bread and we would just talk about the things of God. And we would talk about different topics in terms of what's going on in our society and in the world and how that relates and how that actually connects to the, to the scriptures and to the Bible. Mm. And, um, and, you know, and, and like you would say, and even like, like, um, like, um, like Deborah would say, you know, basically we did things on steroids. <laughs> yeah. We talked about things of God on steroids and we would do that all the way up until maybe five, six o'clock at night until the evening service and stuff. So if so, it was literally like, it was a literal Shabbat. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know Shabbat, that's the Hebrew term for Sabbath. Um, you know, like, like God, God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. So in the Hebrew it's called Shabbat. Um, so um, it, all, it forced me, you know, it gave me more of a desire and more of a love for the word. Um, yes. But also it, um, I would say in addition to that, you know, we, we also did the, um, the, the questions and the answers. We did that once a month, you know, when um, in Clark, New Jersey, we did that. And, um, right. you know, when you connected all that together, it just it just gave me more of a hunger and just more of a desire for the word. And um, and, um, you know, I just, you know, and then listening to the conversations and basically everybody pretty much in that fellowship, you know, knowing the Bible, reading the Bible. Um, you know, it encouraged me to step up my game a lot more in terms of, you know, reading did, a lot did, more. Did you find that that season made it easier to resist temptation? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, knew, I knew you would say that. I just wanted to establish that for here for the hearers, because I believe that that also goes back to pursuing Christ. You were intentional yes. and you drove over an hour to be part of those services and to be part of that fellowship group. And yep. uh, and like many other people, you looked forward to that every week. And yes. it would be fair to say, right? So it was like Acts 2.42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread. Some think breaking of bread is fellowship, right? A lot of our churches think if you just eat together, that's fellowship. But the Bible mm. separates fellowship from breaking of bread and in prayers. And so what you're saying is there was this season where we all gathered at my house uh, weekly. For most part, sometimes we would go to Deacon, we'd go to Tom, right? Tom's house. Yes. And, um, and we, we gathered around the word of God and prayer. Give me. And, uh, and conversation. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Just give me one second. My phone's about to die. I have to plug this in really okay, quick. Okay. So for those of you that don't know, we kind of did this. And uh, what it did is it gave an empowered uh, people to be able to uh, to stand, right? Because you're in community, right? And when other people are able to be transparent and vulnerable about where their struggles, their challenges are, and they share how they overcame or what they're doing, that empowers you. So uh, one of the things you want to do, if you haven't done it yet, is make sure you become a part of a local community where it's more than just going to church. It's actually getting together with people outside the four walls getting to know one another, take down the mass, take down the worship experience and the fact that we all have gifts and everybody knows one another and some people are higher than others because they have better gifts than others. No, everybody comes down to a level playing field where the body of Christ is submitting to one another in the fear of God and it is one of the strongest ways to grow into grace and knowledge of God. So Brother Mike said, as I get ready to wrap this up, his practical steps were, number one, he had hope. The Bible says that God is the God of hope, and you can pray and ask God to fill you. God says that may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace 
in believing that you may abound in hope. That's Romans chapter 15. We can abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. If you lack hope, if, you, if you're doubt, filled with doubts, you think, I'm getting too old and I'm never going to get married. I'm never, no, no, no. Whenever you, you have that language, just put that to death. I can give you example after example of people who've gotten married in their 40s, who got married in their late 30s, and uh, people who got married even older, right? But they were faithful to God and God met them where they were, right? So our brother said he had hope. Secondly, he made no provision for the flesh. He didn't make excuses. Hey, I've been single all this time. I'm now 11 years in. I'm 12 years in. It's never going to happen. So I am going to compromise. And one thing I love about you, Mike, is, as, as, as I do many of the other young men, I call, well, I say young men. Now I sound extra old. Many, many of the men in, in our, you know, that were part of this group is I love. You're a young guy too. What was that? I said, you're a young guy too, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Right. The, the zeal that you guys have for Christ was continued, was inspiring and refreshing to me. And I praise God for your ability to make no provision for the flesh, to identify the things that could be a temp temptation, could be a challenge, and don't hang around them. Don't don't stand there and 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 will like I used to do this, you know, when I was really part of the Pentecostal church in the 90s. I'd stand around speaking in tongues in front of women that I'm attracted to thinking I'm going to, you know, that the desire is going to go away. <laughs> so I was a little bit naive. But but anyway, God says, make no provision for the flesh. Thirdly, you said you changed your focus. So you turned in another direction. You didn't put things in front of you that would be appealing, that would tempt you to fall. You decided I'm not going to make it easier. One, not only am I not going to make allow provision for the flesh i'm going to turn in another direction so that i'm not seeing or i'm not exposed to the things that may draw my heart out uh in in that that direction that may not please the lord and then you said you pursued christ you went after him you spent time in the word you chose to go after the lord with everything that was in you right and i praise god for your heart there and the last thing you said is you set up rules. You had rules. You established rules. Can we talk a little bit about that? You didn't talk about what that meant, but I thought that was good. So it wasn't enough to, to avoid and to pursue Christ. You seemed like you were now thinking forwardly. You were thinking ahead. Uh, and so what would be some of the things you, some of the rules you, you or boundaries you put in place for yourself? Anything practical you could share? Uh, like I was saying, um, you know, just going to the gym and, um, you know, there's attractive, beautiful women in there um, on a regular basis. And, um, you and know, you, um, and you're a personal trainer as well. Yes. Yes. Right. So, yeah. So you could train women also. Yes. Yes, okay. I have. Um, so I would just say, like, um, you know, like, a like. For, in, for instance, if you're walking down the street, you're walking down the street and, you know, you just happen to see, you know, a pretty woman, a pretty girl or something like that. You know, it's like, um, you know, you can't help that if, you know, if you ha you happen to see them. Right. All right. Now, now, you know, God, that's not that's not sin before God if you see somebody. But the sin comes in is if um, you see that person and you know, thoughts or whatever start to play in your head and in your heart and everything. And, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, lust starts to form or if, um, instead of keep continuing to walk, um, you turn around and you, and you do a second look or whatever. Right. You know? So, um, I've been I guess there. I've been in, yep. what's that? I said, I've been there. Yeah. So, um, you know, but being in the gym, I would see somebody like, for, you know, for like a quick second and um, and then automatically it's like I would I would immediately like avoid them or turn like in a different direction. And and it's like my peripheral vision would tell me that that basically that they're walking a certain way. And it's like I would deliberately not look in that direction. And it's like the Lord, the Lord just trained me that way. And um, and, you know, it, it helped me avoid a lot of um, temptation and, and, you know, and lust in my heart and my mind. Praise God. Praise God. Well, well, our sister, Sister Shireen 
says, Mike, your testimony is such a blessing and reminds me of the way a wonderful friend of mine has chosen to live his life as a single man. Thank Amen. you for sharing and being transparent. Amen. And I, God bless you, sister. And I know Brother Mike very well. We speak regularly. Uh, he has called me personally to admonish and challenge me, now being a single man again since my wife has passed. How you doing, brother? How you how you holding up? You know, and uh, and so Mike, I really appreciate your uh, your love and your support, and uh, and, um, and 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 I would say to all of you, it's so important to have people in your life that you can feel accountable to to some degree. Would to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord, and uh, mm-hmm. anyone that's trying to run this race on their own is a little bit deceived and naive. Uh, brother uh, Slave to Christ says, "Where is the church you attend located?" So the church that Mike is talking about is uh, New Jersey. Um, I am now at a church in Easton, PA. I live in Pennsylvania, and the church I attend is in Easton, PA. If you live near the area, brother, um, if you want to message me, I can get you information on how to find um, how to find us. And Mike, uh, I'll I'll be speaking next week. Uh, I'll share with you on the topic. Uh, it'd be nice to have you guys come out and have fellowship and. You know, dinner around the table. That'll be really cool. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I figured I'd tell you since I got you live. That'll yeah. be the twentieth. So you got so you got a week to prepare. <laughs> I'll tell Holly. Yeah. For Great, those thanks. of you who don't know Holly, Holly is my beautiful wife. Yeah. And she is a beautiful and wonderful woman of God. And uh it's it's been a blessing to see how God brought you two together. And um I know that my my lovely bride in heaven is um uh, celebrates, you know, celebrates, you know, the two of you and uh, what you have, what you have become, what you have become in your marriage. It's been a, a, tr- a true blessing and very refreshing. So thanks for jumping on, man. I appreciate you coming live. Uh, do you have any last words for, for me or for anybody here before I shut this down? Um, You know, this, just, um, just yeah. be encouraged to be encouraged. Um, You know, if you're, if you're single, um, you know, focus and put your energy on the Lord. Um, I would just say, um, I was actually just, just talking, um, to a family member of mine today, a younger family member of mine today. Um, cause you know, he's, you know, he's been single, um, he's single right now and, um, you know, he's basically living in purity mm-hmm. and, um, and I was just telling him about, um, you know, when it comes to finding a wife, you know, there's, you know, I believe, I believe two things can be true at once in the word, you know, in Genesis, it talks about how, um, God had brought Eve to Adam. And, but also it says in, um, in Proverbs eighteen twenty two, he that finds a wife finds a good thing. So, um, so, you know, God can bring a wife to you if, if you're, um, if you're a brother and, um, you know, and then also, you know, you have to be active and and pursuing and looking for a wife and put yourself in situations where, um, you know, you can find a godly wife, you know, and um, and I will say that's not at the club, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, well, that's an important but, um, thing, right? If you're gonna, the yeah. Bible says, "He that findeth a wife finds a good thing and obtains yeah. obtains favor of the Lord." I mean, that's mm-hmm. powerful, man. There and, is um, favor that you get being married that you don't get as an unmarried single man. Go ahead. And, and to the sisters, I would just say that, um, you know, Brother Sean had actually did a, a video, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think it was called being um, Stop Saying You're Married to Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, sisters, um, he that finds a wife finds a good thing. But, you know, listen, you have to you have to do things to be found. And be in places where he could find you at, you know. So, um, so pray about that. Ask God to give you wisdom in that area, and um, you know, it, it will happen, Lord willing. That's that's so important, brother. That's so important. A lot of a lot of church people miss the practical steps, right? That we are co-laborers with God. There's some things God won't do that we have to do. We, I never, I've never prayed, Lord, wash my dishes. Like we know, I've never prayed, Lord, can you clean my bathroom? Like we know there's things we have to do, but somehow when it comes to spiritual things, 
we turn off our mind, we turn off our brain. And there's so many people that stay home thinking, I'm just going to wait on God. I'm just waiting for God to bring my man. And, uh, you know, and I'm saying, you know, um, Ruth uh, put herself in place in one sense to be found. And, yeah. uh, you know, um, you know, there's lots of practical ways to to, you know, visit other churches. There's less things you can do going there to look for someone. But and I'm not saying God can't do it with you just being at the food store or whatever. But I but I do think there are some roadblocks that people can put in the way of themselves and women. You know, one of the things women do is, well, I'm, not, I'm married to Jesus. I don't need to, you know, and when you put that air out there, you know. Um, and um, you, you get you kind of get those results, you know. God says the woman, was made, the woman was made for the man. Amen. And I would just say, just add one other thing as well, too. One of the things that definitely helped me early on um, in my walk as as a believer was being connected with a singles ministry, and um, being part of a singles ministry. Um, you know, going to different events and, and different activities with the singles ministry because, um, you know, you were connected with a lot of like-minded people, um, mm -hmm. both brothers and sisters in the Lord. And, um, you know, that, that definitely helps as well, too. Yes. You know, to be, to be in fellowship, you know, um, with, with the singles and stuff. So, um, you know, if you could find a, a good, thriving singles ministry, um, if you have one at your church or maybe, you know, a church where they might actually have one at, then, you know, go ahead and, um, you know, pray about it. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom and, and, and give you discernment and, um, and check it out, you know, and maybe yeah. if, um, if you can't find one, then maybe you need to start one. That's, that's good advice. I would say, mm -hmm. yeah, like, even if, if your church doesn't have one, it doesn't mean you can't go to some other church for just that part. It's still the body of Christ. So many people will think, well, my church doesn't have this thing, so I'm just going to leave. Oh, if they have a singles group that's meeting Friday or Saturday and your regular service is Sunday, why can't you just still go to your regular service and then go to the singles thing at the other church another time? I, there's so much lack of practical wisdom that's missing among God's people. And uh, and uh, and may may the Lord continue to give us grace. You know, it's the reason why I set up this uh, channel and decided to go in this direction. Mike, thank Amen. you. Man. It's a blessing to uh, fellowship with you. Uh, uh, hopefully, we'll see you guys next week. Um, Amen. It'll be a blessing. Um, I don't know what the topic. I don't know what I'm gonna preach on yet. I don't know, but I'm praying about it. But uh, I want to end with this text, Galatians five. Uh, slave of Christ posted it. It says, in comparison to the works of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. It's Amen. not that we're under the law, but once we are walking in the Spirit, we don't need the law to be a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit, excuse me, who's producing the fruit in our life. And so if you're going to be stand as a single, you need to pray that God would fill you with his spirit. Yes. Right. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. And these all of these help. And I can go into why these are so critical. They're so critical to living as a Christian and more importantly, as a single. Brother uh, Slave to Christ, Brother Slave to Christ, in closing, says, I've heard women express hesitancy of meeting men at church because of dating your co-worker, and if it doesn't work out. Well, that, is, that has to be the worst logic I think I've ever heard. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't even make sense. Um, but, Brother, yeah, I, I could see where, you know, you're, you're, you, come you come across a lot of different type of, of philosophies and views out there. Um, God's church is, is bigger than a, a, a local assembly. And I, I, I think with my daughters, that would be one of the first places I say I would want to go to a, an environment where Christians gather, whether that's a Christian school or that's a Christian church. Uh, that doesn't mean you go there with your guards down. You still should be sober and vigilant. You should still prove all things and hold fast to that which is good, because even in those circles, you can be deceived by pe pe you know, with people who have professions of faith that are not living it. So 
Yeah, that's a weird one, Slave of Christ. I have not heard that. That is unique. Uh, so they look at that like dating your coworker. You don't want to date someone. So again, I, I say date. You can find. You may be identified by someone in another church. I don't know. You know, there's lots of ways here. We have all sorts of experiences or examples of different men and women of God who, in different environments, um, God was able to connect them. Mm-hmm. So, brother, thank you again for for being vulnerable. And jumping on, let me end by, I'm going to put up your five steps again. You know, hope, make no provision for the flesh, grow in your hope, make no provision for the flesh, change your focus, right? Commit to pursuing Christ, and then set up some boundaries. Make sure you develop some rules. For Mike, going being a personal trainer and being in the gym, he knew when he saw certain things, I need to avoid that person. I need to go in this direction. I am not going to take a second look. Uh, those are all disciplines. And um, I praise God for your testimony. And uh, may he continue to use you, brother. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, guys, it's been, uh, it's, it was a good night, I think. I hope this was helpful. Again, I apologize to those of you that that came on at 9, expecting to, for me to go live. Um and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to do better next time. But I, I I didn't have any. So, you know, Mike, I have a full house. You know, Madeline's here. A whole bunch of people are here. They were all downstairs. And there was too much noise for me to go live. Oh, okay. my, so I had to kind of make a place up uh, to uh, to be able to go live. So praise God. Yeah, man. All right, brother. All righty. Good night, brother. everybody. All right. Love you. All all right. right. Phil Bye. says, uh, all good. Always a blessing to listen in. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that.